So, uh, basic topic we're going to go over today is our proof marks and other identifying marks. Uh, this is going to hopefully just barely scratch the surface. Um, it is an incredibly deep subject. It's a lot of it is simply exposure and memory. Um, there's not there are not necessarily a whole lot of patterns to things. Um, what I wanted my goal here is to familiarize everybody with what patterns there are and give you some exposure to some of the the weird things, maybe some of the counterintuitive things, some of the elements that you might not normally look for um, on older firearms. Um, a lot of our modern stuff is does have fairly predictable rules to it, and the markings tend to make a lot of sense and work well. Older stuff, they don't always make sense. Um, you can't always necessarily see them. You may have conflicting marks because the gun's been around for 100 or 120 years traveling around the world. Um, and even when there are strict pattern rules, they may get broken from time to time um, because it's just what happens uh, over the course of a 100-year firearm life. So my name is Ian McCollum. I run a website called ForgottenWeapons.com where I try to research and poke into weird, very obscure, when possible, prototype and experimental firearms, uh, primarily military. What I'm focusing on here, as you can see, is 1880 to 1945, which is kind of the, the golden age of military firearms. Um, we're, only going, we're not going to do anything earlier um, than self-contained cartridges, and we're pretty much going to end this around World War II. Um, Post-World War II is when we see more of the, the modern systems of markings that make sense and that you probably don't need someone like me to tell you about. So I figured I'd start with a picture of something that has about, well in this case, three different sets of markings on it, um, including two serial numbers and several different calibers. Does anyone know what that is? Yes. It is, as you say, it's a K98 Mauser. It was made in Czechoslovakia in 45. Um, it was then sold or otherwise acquired by the Israelis, who in the early 50s or mid 50s rebarreled it to 7.62 NATO. Then they used it, a lot of it, um, and then it either went to Guatemala and then to the US, or it may have come directly to the US, where for importation reasons, it was stamped with yet another new serial number. Uh, just an interesting conglomeration of the number of different things you can see all stamped into about a single square inch. There we go. So um, overall, the types of markings we're going to take a look at uh, cover the gamut of everything, pretty much everything you will see on a firearm. Um, got dates, which can be dates of several different things, um, countries of origin, manufacturer names, serial numbers. Um, we're going to spend more time on proof marks than on most other things because there are more systems there that we can look at and actually gain some understanding of. Um, you'll find things like possibly unit numbers. You'll find import marks. That's primarily an American thing. Um, actually, do we have anyone in here who works outside of the US? Where are you from? Taiwan. Okay. Import marking probably won't be of a whole lot of use to you. I don't know what Taiwan's legal issues are regarding import, but we'll, we'll get to that when we get to import marks. Um, Patent markings you'll find, uh, model names and numbers, brand names, which may or may not be the same as manufacturer names, uh, military acceptance marks, military refurbishment marks, um, caliber conversions, um, well, and original caliber itself. So one of the things that I want to stress is that first impression is not always accurate. For example, um, I assume there are some folks in here who recognize what that rifle is. Anyone know? Okay. Yes, that is a, an uh, 1891 Mosin Nagant. It's a standard issue rifle of Russia and the USSR for like a thousand years. And um, who wants to take a guess where that was made? So the initial obvious guess is it's a, it's a Russian rifle. It's covered in Russian writing. It was probably made in Russia when in fact it was made in France. Uh, this <coughs> writing right here, this is Ordnance Factory Chatellerault. 
which was a major French state uh, arsenal for like a thousand years. Um, and when the Russians first adopted the Mosin Nagant, they didn't have the industrial production set up to build the rifles right away, and they contracted with the French uh, to build them through about 1895. Um, and you'll notice on this guy, it's an 1893 dated rifle. If we know the details, the background of the Mosin Nagant, that 1893 is a clue that this could have been produced somewhere other than Russia, because they weren't making them in Russia that early. Um, a couple more examples of the same thing. Uh, you'll notice as we go through this that I tend to use Mosin Nagant as examples for a lot of things. Those rifles have been pretty much everywhere on the planet. They've been around for 120 odd years now. Um, and you can find examples of almost everything that we're going to talk about on Mosin Nagant. And I personally just kind of think they're pretty cool. So those will be popping up from time to time. Um, these are both Mosin Nagant uh, barrel shanks. You'll see one is, was made by the New England Westinghouse Company in uh, New York, or in Connecticut, um, and one by Remington. These are authentic. Uh, the Russian government during World War I was dramatically short of arms, and they contracted with a couple American companies to manufacture on the order of three million Mosin Nagant rifles. And so you will from time to time see what appears at first glance to be a strictly Russian gun, but it was actually made in the US. Um, as I said, first impression is not always accurate. Uh, there are a lot of details to consider, and you really have to take a whole gun into context and understand what you're looking at in order to effectively and properly identify it. So I figured we'd start with proof marks, since that's the biggest single uh, group of identifying markings that we're going to take a look at, and it's one of the more universal. You'll find you know, there, there are actually systems and elaborate systems for proof marks. So of all the stuff on here, the only thing that is actually a proof mark is this guy. It's a, a crown over a BM uh, in a circle. Uh, proof marks, just to establish it at a base level, the idea of a proof mark is to allow, in fact, public safety, uh, industry uh, reputation in an area, and government oversight. So. The notion of a proof mark is that we will have an independent, either a third party commercial entity or a government run entity that will guarantee and ensure uh, firearm safety. That if someone makes a gun and says, this is in 38 special, that firing a 38 special in it will not cause it to explode and kill you or blow your hand off. Um, as you can see, there are a couple different reasons to do this. The first is an altruistic interest in public safety that we don't want people running around with guns that are exploding on them that are patently unsafe. Um, and this was one of the government motives to institute proofing systems. One of a, a lot of the proof mark systems were actually uh, instituted, at least in part, at the behest of firearms industry. Early on, when you're talking 1700s, 1800s, what you tended to have was almost guild systems of firearms manufacturers. And they would tend to conglomerate around industrial areas that were conducive to firearms manufacture. So places that had, um, for example, Birmingham in England had very good sources of coal. Um, they were able to get good steel. You put those two together and you have the basis for an industrial area. Get some good craftsmen, you start making guns. You're not going to be making guns, say, on the fields of Kansas in 1800 because there's no raw material for it. Um, those industries, while the, they may have been made up of a lot of very small workshops, they realized that if you, we didn't have the internet back then, obviously. The way you could identify where a gun came from was something like, it's an English gun, or it's a gun from Birmingham. And it was a lot more likely people would know that than they would know which particular little three-man shop it came from. So these, these workshops realized this, and they got together and said, well, if we put together some standards that will govern our entire community, then we can improve our own uh, reputation with a worldwide audience. And that is, in part, what led to systems of proof marks. Um, and thirdly, government oversight. Uh, having a centralized depot that all newly manufactured firearms go through is a really good way for national and local governments to keep tabs on who's making guns and how many are being made and what's being made and where they're being sold. Um, kind of a, a natural instinct of government to want to have its finger on the pulse of something like firearms manufacture. 
So um, what a proofing test actually is, is we're going to take a cartridge that is deliberately and very specifically over pressure, fire typically one, sometimes two rounds through every single gun that gets manufactured to make sure that there are, say, no hidden flaws in the barrel that cause it to explode with an overpressure round. Um, occasionally this is done like one high pressure round and then one standard or a couple standard rounds. Uh, and typically the proof load is going to be either 25 or 30 percent above the standard pressure of the cartridge that the gun is being made in. Um, just for example, we have here a, a box of um, 762 NATO cartridges. It's a big old dangerous label uh, for proofing M60s. Uh, US arsenals made this sort of thing. Um, it's out there for pretty much every cartridge. Um, and this is still done today, obviously. Um, I should say before I move on, uh, this was also done with black powder. Uh, in fact, pretty much all of the European systems uh, used black powder initially for proofing with basically the same standard. You'd put enough extra powder to get this kind of overpressure level. Um, we'll start with England, although I should actually back up just a step and start with the US. The US has no national regulated proofing system like virtually all of Europe does. And I think it's primarily because of um, historical circumstance. Um, the US did not have a lot of this guild sort of uh, organization develop like it did in Europe over several hundred years. Um, and it never became, um, it, it may also have something to do with just the, the American psyche in general there was, and still is, no national overseeing government controlled body in charge of firearm safety. Um, obviously we have general consumer protection laws that cover a lot of this sort of thing, but we do not have a proof system like Europe does. So you will never find a, an American proof mark. You may find military acceptance marks that have the same sort of uh, basis, um, but we don't have a system like most of Europe. So moving back to Europe, um, we'll start with England. Um, England is one of these European countries where they have a, a proofing system that dates back quite a ways. Um, it does go back earlier than 1868, although 1868 is when they passed the first really modern looking proof law. Um, obviously 1868 there was no smokeless powder. Um, smokeless powder behaves significantly different from black powder. In 1904 uh, the British legal system or the British proof law was updated to address the question of smokeless powder, which basically means develop a, an additional proof mark to uh, denote that a firearm has been tested with smokeless powder. Um, just because you reach a given pressure with black powder and a given the same given pressure, peak pressure, with uh, smokeless doesn't necessarily mean they have the same pressure curve, and a smokeless charge can be more dangerous than a black powder charge. Um, one of the unique elements in the British proof law is that they did not automatically recognize foreign proof marks. So just because it was with pretty much every other country, if a gun came into the country with some other nation's proof mark, you know, if you were in Germany and you imported a, a firearm from England and it had English proofs, that's fine. The German law recognized that. Um, again, I should back up a step and say that typically with these laws, uh, the consequence was it was illegal to show for sale or to actually sell or transfer a firearm that was not proofed, which puts the onus on the manufacturer to proof every gun because they can't sell it if they don't. Um, so in, in England, if you imported a German gun, for example, it would have to be reproofed by British standards, which does give you an interesting element of traceability on British guns. Um, this lasted up until, I believe, the 1980s. Uh, so if you find a, you may find a firearm that has both British proofs and say German proofs. And the rationale for that is that it was made in Germany. Let's presume it was proofed in Germany. It was imported into England at some point. And when it came into England, it had to be reproofed in order to meet English law. Uh, depending on the style of proof mark, you may be able to determine from that when it was imported into England and start to get a handle on the whole history of where this firearm has been its whole life. Uh, one of the other eccentricities of the British proof law is that they measured pressure in tons. So you'll find British guns that are marked 4 tons or 3.5 tons, um, and that's uh, tons per square inch instead of pounds per square inch. And they don't usually say per square inch. They may say 
per, and then actually have a little square, which indicates square inch, uh, but typically it'll just say tons. So there are two uh, British proof houses. Uh, the more common appears to have been Birmingham, um, which was a center of gun manufacture. There was also a proof house in London. Uh, prior to 1904, the, the regulations were a little bit looser, or, or not looser, but uh, simpler. And there's basically one standard proof mark that you will find on firearms proofed in England prior to 1904 in Birmingham, and it's this one. Uh, the BCP stands for Birmingham Company Proof. Um, and this indicates a black powder gun. If this is all you see on the thing, it's black powder. Um, it may be a black powder cartridge gun. You know, don't test fire that thing with smokeless loads. If you run into a very early Webley revolver, say, that is only proof for black powder, don't throw a smokeless 45 ACP in it because it logistic, le legitimately could blow up in your hand. Um, now, some of these guns were before they established a, a formal proof mark for smokeless powder, they may be smokeless proof because they were manufacturing smokeless guns before then. If that's the case, you will find it marked nitro proofed or nitro proved sometimes. Uh, 1925 things got updated a bit and now we have a, a little more uh, extensive system going on. There are different marks for Birmingham and London, of course, and they don't necessarily make sense. Um, this is one of those areas where there is a set of rules, but they don't follow any particular pattern, like we got crowns and crowns, and then we've got a dude with a sword instead of a crown uh, for no particular reason. Um, a CP, uh, you know, there are all sorts of ways this could make legitimate sense, and it doesn't. Um, the three different marks, and you'll often find all three of these. Um, so a view, uh, let's see, let's start with the, the nitro proof. Uh, nitro is going to be a common um, synonym you'll find for smokeless powder. So high velocity smokeless powder is called nitro by pretty much everyone in Europe. Um, nitro proof means we took this 25% overpressure cartridge and we fired it in the gun. And nothing catastrophic happened. So then we'll stamp an NP on it. Next step is what's called a view proof, which means we took a look, we inspected the parts of this gun and determined that, you know, nothing catastrophic happened, but okay, there's a crack halfway through the barrel now that we didn't see. That sort of thing is what they're looking for when they're viewing or inspecting the firearm after firing a proof load in it. Assuming nothing is amiss, it gets a view proof, and then it gets a final proof when it goes out of the proof house saying everything's done. Uh, this gun is safe and legal to sell now. Uh, and you'll find these on multiple parts. Um, in England and in general through Europe, um, the, the regulated components of a firearm are the pressure bearing parts. In the US we're used to receivers being a big deal um, and the focus of most of our laws. In England they don't care about the receiver. You know, you look on something like an AK, a receiver is just a chunk of sheet metal that's kind of bent. Um, in the US, yeah, we focus on that. In England, they don't care because anyone can build a receiver from a piece of sheet metal by bending it a little bit. What's difficult to manufacture and what actually has all of your safety margins or your important ones are the pressure bearing parts. So the barrel, um, the cylinder in a revolver. Sometimes the frame, um, the frame of a revolver may or may not um, be an important element in a particular design. But you'll find these proof marks in particular uh, nitro and view proofs on multiple components. So you would, in fact, yeah, we have to go a little bit farther before we get to an example picture. But um, so barrel, barrels and frames are the two common ones. You'll find all the marks somewhere on the center of the gun, um, often on the frame because it's convenient. You'll almost always find a nitro proof on the barrel. Uh, you may also find a view proof on the barrel. And sometimes you'll find them on a whole bunch of extra parts triggers, hammers, without necessarily a whole lot of rhyme or reason. Um, now I said we were going to stop at uh, World War II, but we'll go a little bit farther in this case. Um, after 54, the British changed the system again, and they simplified it a bit. Um, and they basically consolidated these three marks into just one. Uh, with Birmingham, it's a BNP under a crown. 
And it's important to note that this is post-54. Um, in Britain, if you had a firearm that was substantially uh, retrofitted, repaired, rebuilt, say rebarreled, it would have to be reproofed. So you may have a firearm that was made in 1916, say it's an Enfield rifle. Um, the receiver is going to have some, some of these proof marks on it, or possibly, yeah, most likely these guys. Um, and then it gets rebarreled, and the barrel gets stamped with a BNP when it gets reproofed. Um, in Birmingham, they just had this one mark that they used everywhere. In London, for no particularly good reason, they would have one mark for the action and a separate one for the barrel. Um, probably has something to do with the internal organization of the London Proof House and how product flowed through their system. I mentioned earlier on that the British didn't automatically recognize other people's proof marks. Um, and the way they indicated this is when they reproofed a foreign gun, they would give it a different mark. Um, they'd take the same thing and put it in a circle. And this can apply to pretty much all of those proof marks. So the final proofs, the nitro proofs, the view proofs, you'll find them in a circle indicates it's a foreign made gun. Usually it has this big, totally non, well, not large, but non-subtle stamping right next to the proof that says, not English made. Um, you know, you're taking your life in your hands when you fire this thing because we didn't make it. Because this wasn't sophisticated enough yet, we also have a system of dating. Um, this is specific to Birmingham. Um, I haven't been able to find a lot of information on London Proof House. Um, they, I would expect they would probably use these same systems, but it is definitely uh, Birmingham. Uh, and it is, it's a stylized pair of cross scepters. Um, same style as that very early 1904 proof mark. Uh, and you, you will have to examine this sort of thing probably with a magnifying glass, unless your eyes are really good, because these are very small stamps. We're talking three millimeters square on that order. Um, they started this dating system in the Birmingham proof house in between 22 and 23. And the only thing that changes in it is the letter here. And this changed each year, but it didn't change at the beginning of the new year. It changed halfway through the year. So A means it was sometime between, I'm sorry, I have a typo there. This is 21, 22. Um, A means it was made sometime between 1921 and the end of 1922. B means sometime from midpoint in 22 to midpoint in 23. They didn't use I and Q. Uh, because in a stamp as small as this, they're liable to be mistaken with one and zero. Uh, this system ended uh, in 40 slash 41, and there was no substitute until after World War II because there basically was no commercial gun production in England. Um, the military had their own set of markings. Uh, this is for commercial firearms. It, they weren't building them. You know, in 1942, you did not go down to the you know, sportsman's warehouse in London and buy yourself a new rifle because those guys were all making guns for the troops. When they reinstituted the system um, after World War II, they went to one that made a bit more sense. Um, we have a couple different data points here. The letter on the left indicates the year of manufacture. So a D in this case is 1954. B goes back to standing for Birmingham and doesn't change. And then the number at the bottom is the number of the specific inspector who examined this particular gun. So the number at the bottom will change, but it doesn't have any particular significance. Um, if you need to know who the inspector was, you'd need that number, but I don't know of any effective resource for finding out or any reason you'd need to know. Um, obviously, at the time, that's a safety check. You know, that's like an uh, a signature from the inspector so that if you know, 25 guns came back in a month having blown up, we know what inspector we need to take a look at. Um, and, of course, because the rules are never going to be consistent. This, this uh, later system, they did use I. They didn't use Q still, but they did use I. So here's um, one very typical example. This happens to be a number five Lee Enfield rifle, which would have been manufactured in the late 40s or early 50s. This picture is of the barrel shank. This particular gun was rebarreled in 1954. Uh, we can tell that, if we didn't already know it, from the BNP stamp, which uh, started in 1954. We have a caliber marking on the barrel uh, indicating what it 
has been rebarreled too. Obviously, this rifle would have started out life in 303 British. And then we have that crossed scepter, and it has a Z, B, and 4. Z equates to 1974. That's the last year that you'll see that type of marking. Um, any questions before I move on away from England? Yeah. yeah. In your previous slide, um, you just said that I was used to not shoot, but your slide says I was not used to anymore. Oops. I'm sorry. So the slide is correct. The slide is correct? The slide is correct, okay. yes. Um, and I will make these, this presentation available to you guys afterwards. Um, I'll put it up on the net where you can download it if you'd like a copy of it. Anything else? All right, moving on. Belgium, uh, small country. We don't necessarily think of Belgium as being particularly influential in many things, but Belgium was a massive um, gold standard in the firearms industry for a very long time. Frankly, they still are. Um, FN is still in Belgium, obviously. Um, Belgium is one of those other kind of epicenters of firearms manufacture where they had this perfect combination of international trade and raw materials and skilled craftsmen. And um, in particular, uh, the, the area around Liège developed as a gigantic center of interna international arms manufacture. Uh, the other thing that really helped out Belgium in this way is that they tended to be neutral in a lot of conflicts, and they were perfectly happy to sell guns to anybody in Europe. Uh, so you'll find a lot of Belgian guns got outside of Belgium. You know, a lot of other countries you know, their military arms will only go to, you know, you don't see a lot of French military weapons sold outside of France or sold to non-French countries. Belgium supplied a lot of people, which means that they needed a good proofing system uh, to maintain a reputation and, and you know, consumer confidence basically around the rest of the world. Uh, one of the earliest formal proofing, proofing uh, laws was a royal decree Belgium was actually, I believe, a German protectorate um, at this time. It was a, a German emperor who, or Germanic emperor, who declared um, this particular royal decree in 1672. Um, and originally it was just barrels. You know, these were muzzle loaders, and the only pressure bearing part really there is a barrel. Um, the formal, the modern version of the proof law was 1888. Uh, they instituted a proof house in Liège, which is the home of FN and several other gun companies. Um, and as I mentioned before, the, the consequence was, yeah, you, you don't technically have to proof a gun, but if you don't proof it, you can't sell it, you can't even offer it uh, on display for sale. Um, 1891, they were really on the, the cutting edge here compared to a lot of countries. 1891, they instituted a system for proofing smokeless powder. Um, if you, for people who aren't familiar with the history, because sometimes I take things for granted that I shouldn't, um, the first commercial effective smokeless powder was 1886 in France. Um, so five years to get this technology from its first real appearance to having a, a legal, commercial, established system for uh, testing it is, is really quite good at that time. So Belgian proof marks. Um, you will see these on a lot of uh, cheap revolvers came out of Belgium at the time. Um, again, we had a lot of very small workshops producing Cheap consumer firearms. Um, it, it, there's no pattern to these things. This is a matter of take notes, memorize them, because you're not going to intuit what these marks mean, unfortunately. I wish it were that easy. Um, so first one we see is a crown over an R. This is a black powder proof on a barrel specifically. <laughs> uh, most likely only a rifled barrel. Smoothbore stuff had a slightly different system. Um, I did mention that we're barely scratching the surface here. Um, I'm not even touching on the shotgun proof marks, which are typically different from rifle and pistol proof marks. They cover a lot of the shotgun um, laws in these countries will cover marking the specific load that is proofed, how long the shell is, how much powder is in it, what weight of shot. We're not even going to get into that today. Um, that's another whole world. At any rate, R crown on a barrel, Belgian. Um, you'll also see this fairly typically on Belgian guns and in a, a couple different variations. Um, this is actually a national monument, a lot smaller than you'd expect today for a famous national monument. Uh, in Belgium, it's called the Peron. 
uh, and they use it as a firearms proof mark to indicate it's basically the same as a view proof. It is, we've inspected the gun. This doesn't relate specifically to a pressure, you know, a, a high pressure round being fired. That will have been done. This means we took a look at the thing. It all works. Nothing seems severely out of whack. Um, and it's good to go. Um, that's, that's the significance of the Perone mark. Uh, same size here, we're talking something that's a couple millimeters tall. So you don't see this level of detail actually in the stamp. This thing, 1903 to 1924, but not on revolvers. Obviously. Wow. Um, like I said, these things don't make intuitive sense. What you'll also see is this uh, rampant lion over the letters PV. Um, that is about the same time period, 1898 to 1824, and that's smokeless. So this is an important distinction and a practical distinction that I've actually run into and used myself looking at old guns. Um, if you see a Crown R, it's a black powder proof. If you see a Crown R and not this guy, it means the gun is black powder only. Don't fire smokeless ammo in it. Um, you will often see both because early on, actually for a number of years, a lot of countries would still, even if the gun was designed for smokeless powder, they'd still run a black powder proof through it. Um, how much of that was simply because the law was still on the book and nobody got around or bothered to change it? I'm not sure how much of it might have been um, you know, a safety margin. We'll, we'll try the black powder first, so if it blows up, it's a little less catastrophic than if it blew up with a smokeless round. Um, but you will see both. Um, on a smokeless gun for quite some time into the early uh, 20th century. So, um, and, and a lot of these cheap Belgian revolvers span the gap between black powder and smokeless loads. So keep an eye out for this particular combination or absence of combination. PV, um, poudre vivre, something like that, smokeless powder. Um, and they decided just to go with this guy and eliminate this thing entirely in 1924. So if you see this, you know it's 24 or earlier. If you see just this guy, you can see where these specific sets of dates allow you to get some feeling for where a firearm has been. Second set here. ELG. My French is miserable, basically non-existent. I'm not even going to... Uh, go there. Uh, you will find it both as an oval and an oval with a crown on it. The crown, they put on in 1893. So if it has a crown, it's after 1893. If it doesn't, it's prior to 1893. Um, and that goes back to 1853. How often you'll find a pre-1853 gun? I'm not sure. Probably not all that often. Um, another good distinction. Um, if it's pre-1893, it's definitely not smokeless powder. It's black powder. Be aware of that. Um, one other thing that you will find is a, a letter with a star over it. Um, if it's early, it will be a crown instead of a star. It may be difficult to tell the difference, especially on an older gun that's worn. It'll look like a blob over a letter-like blob. Um, and that's a specific individual inspector's mark. So inspector number one used an A, inspector number two used a B. Uh, letter doesn't have any significance. It doesn't stand for an initial or anything. Um, there are some resources out there that will date, that can identify the inspector and what years he worked uh, based on the letter, but they did reuse letters. So sometimes you may be able to uh, narrow down a date range a little more with one of these, but I think it's probably going to be fairly rare that that'll happen. All right, so an example. Um, this is a firearm that I found on loan, and it was interesting. Little tiny, the whole thing's about this long. 22 caliber pocket revolver. You can see it's got a folding trigger on it. Kind of neat. And taking a look at it, we see a crown R, which means black powder proof on a barrel. We have a star over a U. That's an inspector's mark. We sort of have a serial number, but it's only three digits. And then over here, on the cylinder, you'll see the inspector's mark again. And we have another final proof mark. So looking at these guys, we've got this guy. This tells me it's a final proof. 
So it's gone through everything that the proof house needs to do to it. They've approved the gun. They're happy with it. Stamp that guy on the cylinder. It's good to go out the door. And we have the Crown R. We don't have a PV. We can determine from that that it is, in fact, a black powder gun. Um, it, in, if it were an auto pistol, it would have one of these guys. Because it's a revolver, it doesn't. We shouldn't expect to see it, and we don't. Um, these two photos, by the way, include every single marking that was on the firearm, and that's it. Uh, to be honest, I never did figure out exactly what Cal 22L meant, because this will not fit a 22 long. It'll fit a 22 short. Um, the long and the long rifle are longer than the chamber, longer than the cylinder is. So that one's still a bit of a mystery to me. If anyone knows, tell me. I'd be curious. Any questions on Belgium? No Belgian fans? <laughs> All right. Germany, number three that we're going to look at. So Germany had proof laws, much like Belgium, early on. We're going to ignore those. They don't really apply uh, to the scope of this presentation. The modern German proof law was passed in 1891, took effect in 1893. It took them a little while to get going. It's better than a lot of them in that it is a little bit, as you might expect from Germans, it's a little bit more regulated, um, a little more standardized. <laughs> Still not great, but better than a lot of the others. Um, in 1893 to 1939, you don't have a whole lot of change. Um, in 1939, they made, they actually simplified it what would be a really good system. Um, of course, it only lasted six years. Uh, after World War II, the, the system changed. I'm not going to go into the modern set of German proof marks, which are pretty much the same from the end of World War II to today. Um, they're pretty simple. Um, the rules apply well. You can look that up. Um, a lot of people expect German World War II era stuff to have swastikas on it. They sort of do. They sort of don't. That however, is actually not a proof mark at all. It's a military acceptance mark. And we'll cover that in a minute, actually in a little while. So the German stuff. The Germans, what's really nice, they had a number of different proof houses, uh, four, I believe, um, in different industrial areas of Germany. They all used the same symbols. You know, None of this crowns versus swords versus whatever else someone wants to do. And they, it was a crown with a letter under it. And there were about 12 letters total, the important ones we've got here. So B is black powder, makes sense. N is nitro, makes sense. They translate well from German. Um, G is a rifled bore. S is a smooth bore. Uh, w is a choke bore. So I'm touching a little bit on shotguns here. But they would identify the difference between an open bore shotgun and a shotgun that has a choke on it, because that will impact the pressure generated when you fire. Uh, when the, your shot column hits that choke, pressure builds up. Um, so you may find both of these together on a shotgun. You may find just smoothbore, which tells you it's a cylinder choke. Um, what you will find on sporting guns, German sporting guns, is typically a whole bunch of these stamps. You'll find uh, B, U, G, and N. because. Um, they would black powder proof the barrels and then nitro proof them if they were smokeless rounds. So again, you'll see both of those. If a gun existed prior to 1893, you didn't actually have to run it through this proof test and risk blowing it up with an overpressure round, but you did have to bring it in and get it, not registered, but stamped. So it had to have, had to have gone through the proof house one way or another. And the marking for a grandfathered gun is a V. Um, does not actually indicate that it went through a proof test. But it does mean that it was now legal to put in the, the stream of commercial sale. Um, I should also say this applies to commercial guns. Um, German military firearms were treated differently and did not go through commercial proof houses. Now, the 1939 change, they got rid of the crown. Uh, and they replaced the crown with an eagle. Uh, no swastika here. 
just a, an eagle with spread wings, which is a very common international. You'll find like crowns, lions, and eagles everywhere. Um, and they replaced the B, the U, and the G. So the final proof, the black powder proof, and the nitro proof, um, they replaced them all with just an N. So one stamp instead of three or four. That, of course, is way blown up. It is, as usual, going to be, this one's a little bit bigger, but we're talking three or four millimeters. This is a pretty good typical example of a pre-1939, in this case it's a Mauser sporting rifle. We got the B, the U, the G, and the N. And then this is the beginning of the serial number. Um, not a whole lot of dating you can do from this sort of thing, uh, but it will tell you again, black powder versus smokeless. Um, it will tell you pre-39 versus post-39. Um, there were post-39 sporting guns that were made and sold. Um, we will cover the, the Waffenamt, which is the one swastika marking when we get to military marks later on. Um, Germany. Any questions about Germany? All right. I'm kind of anticipating a lot of this stuff is the sort of thing that you will pretty much not see, except that one time you do see it and it comes in. And then I want to try and cover as much of the, the, the generic, the most common um, things that you'll find once in every couple of years. Um, and actually for that reason, um, when it comes to Italy, we're actually going to look at just black powder proofs for Italy. Uh, because one of the main uh, gun industries in Italy that leads to export into the U.S., aside from you know, modern stuff like Berettas, are uh, reproduction cowboy action guns, Old West guns. And a lot of those are black powder. They actually have a pretty decent system. Their date code is weird. Their proof marks don't have any particular rhyme or reason to them, but they're at least fairly simple. Um, there are a couple of proof houses in Italy. The two main ones, or the two only ones, uh, Brescia and Gardone, have similar but slightly different proof marks. Um, the provisional proof is like when the gun comes into the proof house, we you know, mark that we've, we have received it. It is in the proof house. Um, you'll then have either a black powder or a smokeless proof round fired through the gun. Once that's done, nothing fails, mark that one. And then the final definitive proof is we're done, it's good, out the door, ready to sell. So a typical Italian firearm you would have, like one of these black powder uh, revolvers, you would have a provisional proof. Uh, I believe they're mostly Gardone with the, uh, the black powder guns. You'd have a black powder proof, you'd have a definitive proof, uh, or I'm sorry, you'd have the, just the black powder, the provisional, and then a date code. So here's our fantastic system. Uh, it starts with Arabic numbers, then it goes to Roman numerals, and then it goes to letters. With the exception of 71, 72, and 73, we're going to throw some, some Arabic into the Roman, just because. Um, you will see they skip O and Q. Um, they do use I. Um, skipped E. Uh, like I said, this is the sort of thing, until you do a lot of this sort of stuff, keep a sheet of it somewhere, look it up the one time that you need to figure out what the date is on a particular gun. Um, on Italian military stuff, you will also find Roman numerals, but it's a different system of Roman numerals. Um, if it's an Italian military rifle, the Roman numeral is the year of the fascist era in Italy, which started in 22. So if you find an Italian military rifle, stamped with XII, that's 1934. If you find an Italian black powder revolver stamped XII, that's 1956. Clear? Easy, right? There's a good example of it. Um, if we back up for a moment, we can see that CC, 2008. This is a nice recent production. Um, in this case, this picture came off of a, an Uberti replica of an 1858 Remington. So our date code, 2008. This is our black powder proof. This is our Gardone provisional proof. That's all on the frame. Um, occasionally on these, they, a few of the brands actually early on put the proof marks underneath the trigger guard. And you have to physically remove the two screws on the trigger guard to see this stuff. 
Um, typically, it's on the bottom of the frame um, and fairly easy to get to. You will also find a black powder proof on the barrel. Again, multiple pressure bearing uh, components, they're all going to be proofed. Has anyone actually run into like a, one of the Italian replicas in a case? Cool, OK. Good, there's something relevant in this. <laughs> uh, Spain, another one kind of potentially like Belgium that we may not think of as a, a real significant player in firearms manufacture. But uh, Spain, Ibar in uh, north, I want to say western Spain, northeastern Spain, I think. Um, one, another one of those epicenters where we've got a lot of good raw materials, we've got good craftsmen. It all comes together and we get a center of firearms manufacture that dates back actually quite a ways. Um, you may have heard of things like uh, famous Toledo steel in swords dating back hundreds of years. It's that same good steel and good um, coal and wood that puts together a metalworking industry that went from swords into guns. And a lot of it, a lot of Spanish pistols have a pretty crummy reputation in the U.S. these days. Um, but for a long time, they may not have been top shelf guns, but there were an awful lot of them out there. Um, in particular, in World War I, the French contracted with dozens of Spanish manufacturers uh, for army pistols. Little straight blowback 32 automatics, and there were hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of them made. Um, and they continued to make them after World War I uh, on a commercial market. They were popular, they were cheap, they were accessible, they worked pretty well, um, and they had a proofing system that uh, one of the later ones, the, the modern version of it, became mandatory to use in 1923. So that's about the earliest that you'll find a lot of these proof marks. Um, they, kind of like the Italians, have a three mark system, a triad like that. The first mark, well, the last mark um, in the left to right order, is the final proof. That is, we've, it's passed all of our tests, mark a final proof, and out the door it goes. The early one is this uh, rampant lion, or regardant lion. The later one, which covers most of them, is a flaming bomb with a P in it. Uh, the lion is early, 23 to 28. The bomb is 28 and afterwards. The middle item is a date code. It's a letter with a star or a dot over it. Um, indicates a date. This one actually makes sense. It's A through Z. Easy. Uh, and early on, they used a PV. Nobody really appears to be sure what it meant. Maybe smokeless powder. Uh, but they used that instead of a date code. Uh, so the only time you one of the things you can identify with the Spanish system is this very early period, 23 to about 27 or 28, when you'll have this marking and you'll have a PV uh, instead of a date code and a bomb. The last one is a, uh, a shield with, I believe that's supposed to be a representative of a pair of crossed rifles in the middle. Um, they used a crown until 1931 when they kicked King Alfonso out and so then they, they had to get rid of the crown. Uh, so they replaced it with a frilly knight's helmet. Uh, and the, the king fled in 1931. And that's, that's your, your date range here. So from like 23 to 35, you can get a pretty a decent idea of when a gun was made based on these things. Um, same picture we had before. This is a, a typical triad of markings. So we have the late Proofy night means it's post-31. The P actually tells us specifically it's 1945. Um, remember, Spain was neutral in World War II. They continued to make guns and sell guns commercially. They didn't have the, the kind of wartime production restrictions that a lot of countries did. Um, now they made a lot of guns commercially for Germany. They were being run by a fascist dictator, Franco. Um, but you do see Spanish commercial proofs all the way through World War II. Spain, any questions? Have you guys run into any of these uh, kind of cheap Spanish pistols? Tell me, what did you find? What did you run into? I'm, I'm just curious. I don't remember. I, I weed you in the okay. rest of you get a lot of the, the older okay. guns coming. So. All right. One of the, <laughs> okay. Um, the Spanish pistols, they're, 
typically two versions. They made them in 32 and they made them in 25. Um, the 32s are sometimes military. Um, they're, that's what the French military used. The 25s are the exact same gun, just shrunk down a little bit. Uh, smaller, more concealable. They're straight blowback. Uh, you pull the slide back, rotate the barrel, pull it out. They're all made exactly the same way. And absolutely none of them have parts interchangeable with each other because they're all made by these little, or were made by these little dinky shops. There were a couple big companies and a shit ton of, you know, little two, three, five man operations. Um, yeah? <clears throat> I have a picture of one of those I'm using as an example later on, the Hodel R. They're cool, yeah. Um, that's probably one of the few examples of one that works rather differently <laughs> than the standard. Cool. Uh, what caliber was it in? You remember? I remember it took us a long time to find the ammo. So okay. That was the turn. Okay. <laughs> and we'll get to why in, the, in a little while. Um, at any rate, the common ones, the reason they actually had so many of these things is uh, the French were looking for pistols. They sent some sales reps over to Spain because, hey, you know, Spain's neutral in World War I as well. They've got this nice gun-making center. You know, the Germans have overrun Belgium. We can't buy guns from the Belgians. Let's see if we can buy them from the Spanish. And so they show up at what was literally a six-man company. And, and these guys show them their, their little blowback 32. It holds seven or eight rounds. Simple, works, fairly cheap. The French go, great, we want 50000 a month. Yeah, to these six dudes who are, you know, oh, shit. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, so that company, they, they weren't idiots. They said, yeah, you bet, we can do it, anything you want. 100,000, done. And started subcontracting it out to all of the other little two- and three-man shops. And the guns individually, pretty, I mean, they were not fantastic, but they generally worked fine. Um, but they were all being made by different subcontractors, so... The big thing today, if you're trying to like collect and shoot them, is the magazines are not interchangeable. They're basically the same. They look the same, <laughs> but the dimensions are just different enough that you're screwed. If the gun doesn't come with a mag, forget it, because there's literally 50, 60, 70 different manufacturers of the things. Um, and when the war ended, of course, they were all having this great time building these guns, and they just kept doing it and selling them commercially. Um, the other thing you'll see is trade names. There's like the coolest set of trade names ever are on these uh, Spanish. Uh, they're often called Ibar or Ruby. The formal name is Ruby. Um, that was the official one. But you'll find copies with uh, trade names, you know, some of them are, they, some people would do like a Model 1916. Some would say uh, there was a Destroyer, there was a Mars. There were, some of them had trade names in French, um, a lot of them in English. I don't have a list here, but you know, it's just, and no way to really tell what parts go to what. No. All right, that pretty much covers proof marks. Um, does anyone have questions on other elements of proof marks? I know there are a number of countries I skipped um, on the basic reason that uh, you're probably not going to see a lot of them, and they're just really complicated. Um, and trying to figure out the rules and get them presentable is can be tricky. Um, nothing? All right. So, other markings. Um, take a look at, I went over some of these at the beginning. Uh, dates, model name and number, manufacturer name, import marks, serial numbers, calibers, military acceptance, all the other junk that's written on a gun. We'll start with dates. Uh, typically, we're used to, you know, the most common thing is if there's a date on it, it's probably the date it was made. It's not necessarily true. Uh, usually, most common thing, yeah, it's the date of manufacture. It could also be a date the gun was refurbished, uh, rebuilt, repaired by a military arsenal. Um, it could be a date the thing was adopted for military service. It could, you know, it might not be a 1910 made gun. It could be a model of 1910. Um, you will also see occasionally patent dates on firearms, especially earlier ones. Um, those can be a decent way to identify, especially on common stuff. And I didn't go into a lot of this here, but something like a Winchester lever action. If you're trying to figure out when this thing was made, the patent dates are a decent place you can start. Because you know it wasn't made before 
the latest patent date stamped on the thing. And a lot of these guns used multiple patents. Um, they might improve something with you know, Jim Bob's patent of 1904, and then they'll stamp that patent number uh, and date on there as well, or just the number. Basic example, data manufacture. Pretty straightforward. Uh, now, telling, being able to differentiate this from a model number, or a, um, a, 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 yeah, sometimes a serial number, yeah, uh, but also a pattern number. You know, this is an 1872 pattern rifle. That's just a matter of, frankly, Google. Uh, you know, <laughs> you have to know on this particular make of gun, was it the date? Was it not the date? Um, this is one of these areas where context. Look at everything that's going on. Um, you know, if this happened to be serial number 1950, well, does it make sense that we have a single shot, there's no finish left on it, you know, it's got this old world style of font, and it's 1950? Eh, probably not. Um, sometimes they'll amend a manufacture date onto the end of the serial number. So that's an SKS, an Albanian SKS that was made in 1978. This is a Colombian Madsen rifle made in 58. Um, and in a case like this, again, it's context and a lot of it is just every specific stupid gun figuring out what this, the pattern is for that gun. Because a lot of people would probably write this whole thing down as a serial number. And it would work because you're not going to have any duplicates of it. Um, but someone else who recognizes that this is a date is just going to leave it out and write down this as a serial number. So. Um, to make sure that a gun is actually traceable, make sure that you're identifying the correct elements in the serial number as opposed to a date that's amended onto it. Um, a refurbished date, this probably isn't something you're often going to mistake for an original manufacture date, but what it can be is a very good indication of the, the path that a gun has taken. Um, this is an Israeli Mauser, just like that very first picture. When the Israelis rebarreled them into 308, or 7.62 NATO, they stamped the date on the barrel. Um, in this case, June 1958. One of the funny things, and I couldn't find a picture of them, but I know they're out there. There are going to be some. They're going to be stamped 556. And they're not in 223. They are, in fact, in 7.62 NATO, and they were refurbished in May of 56. Um, in this case, this conversion is pretty obvious because they actually burned, they used a big branding iron or something and burned 762 into the stock at about this big. Um, and as you saw in the very first picture, they engraved it big on the receiver ring. One of the nice ones that's easy to tell. Um, when we get to caliber conversions, there are a bunch that are not so easy to interpret. Um, so I said I was going to use most in the Gantz a lot. This is another most in the Gantz. This is a Finnish Mosinagant, and it has what is obviously a manufactured date right there on the barrel along with all the other numbers. Um, that is, however, not a manufactured date because it's on the barrel. Um, Finland, and I'm hoping that this is something that will be of relevant use to you, um, Finland never manufactured a single receiver ever. Every Mosinagant that Finland used, they either bought or captured from the Russians. So the receiver of this gun could have been made any time before 43. It is actually fairly common to run into Finnish guns like this that have, um, and what makes this of particular legal importance, that have pre-1898 receivers. So it could be an 1896 receiver making the gun legally an antique. It's not bound, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be sent to a dealer, it doesn't have to be logged in, it's exempt from, all, you know, Gun Control Act stuff. And yet it's marked 1943, but that's just the date that the Finns put a new barrel on it, which doesn't change its legal status as an antique. Here is where you actually find the date of manufacture on a Mosinagant receiver. You have to pull the receiver out of the stock and look on the bottom of the tang. So this is the very back end of the receiver underneath. There are a couple different uh, versions, different styles of this marking. Um, the very earliest here, 1895, it's an antique. Um, you know, different set of laws applied to this guy. Um, that C in a circle actually means this was made by Chatellerault in France, um, which, isn't, which is interesting, although perhaps not 
directly applicable to anything. Um, a little bit later, we have an 18, uh, 1907 here. You'll sometimes see these as just three digits. So you might find 905, that's 1905. Um, and that's not common, but you'll find that in a lot of different guns. Um, there are a number of different models where they use the last three digits. Um, some South American countries did that. So, you know, a model, you'll find a model 943. And what they actually mean by that is 1943, which may not be immediately evident to us because we don't usually do that here. Um, in this case, you know, this is our arsenal mark down here. Who made it? We have the same thing here. This is a Shevsk arsenal in Russia. Um, this one, I believe, is also a Shevsk, but it's a different version. Um, 1937, R. We'll cover the R in a few minutes. Uh, so most Nagants are one of the most common, um, not necessarily immediately obvious, antique firearms that you'll find out there. I focus on this a little bit because I'm hoping I can keep someone out of trouble who uh, knows they have an antique and some prosecutor doesn't realize it. Uh, model dates. I put them in here, but they're usually pretty obvious. Um, you're not normally going to mistake a, a model number for anything else, because um, usually they'll say model 1903. Um, even the foreign ones, they'll often, if it's French, it'll have an MLE in front of it. Uh, same thing, model of whatever year. Uh, Where you get a little bit tricky is the difference between a, a model number and an adoption date and a manufactured date. So this, for example, this is a pattern of 1869, not an actual 1869 manufacturer. That's a trapdoor Springfield. Unfortunately, I wish I could tell you there was a simple pattern for this sort of thing. Most trapdoor Springfields do have a date of manufacture. Some of the versions don't. And this is one that doesn't. So a lot of this is if you're not intimately familiar with the type of gun that you're looking at, make sure to do the extra, extra research and confirm what the markings mean. Because you can't necessarily assume that the most likely, solute, most likely answer is the correct answer. Um, you've seen this one before. We had this picture a little earlier in the presentation. Uh, another for no good reason whatsoever. When Remington made these, they marked the year they made them. When Westinghouse made them, they marked the year of the contract. So this could be 15, it could be 16, it could be 17. Remington didn't bother to mark that. They, they got the contract in 1915, so they all get marked 1915. And let's see, most unambiguous sort of thing you'll run into is uh, the model of the gun, because it's typically not a number. It's going to be a bunch of other stuff. You'll recognize it, hopefully. Um, it, unless it's a gun that's totally unfamiliar, it, it should clue you into exactly what you're looking at. Um, can be very obvious. US is pretty good about that most of the time. If you look at US World War II stuff, it'll all have this full military designation on it. You know, rifle, comma, caliber this, comma, model of that, um, and then a serial number. The British sort of do it, but they abbreviate it all. So you'll find SHTLE3 star, and that is a short Lee Enfield rifle. Um, if you can read it, they have a date there. You know, some of this older stuff, there's going to be enough wear, um, especially in Enfield. This is all marked right on the wrist above the trigger guard, um, where there's a lot of rubbing on the gun, and it gets a lot of wear over its lifetime. And sometimes these markings are really hard to make out. Um, one of the one of the little interesting details. Uh, there's a this is a you know mark of the, the government. It's a crown over G R for George Rex, King George. You'll on the um, on the Dominion countries at the time you'll find G R I, George Rex Imperator. It's not just King George. It's King George the Emperor of India usually. Uh, the British made ones just have G R. Questions? Anything I've skipped over? Any of this weird stuff anyone has run into and had questions about? Um, yeah. 
that is actually, that's a, there's a lot of information in that. Um, I told you where it was made and when, but you have to read Farsi in order to know it or look it up on Google. Um, those aren't that uncommon. They're either called Persian or Iranian Mausers. Um, these are actually fairly common in the US. A lot of them came back after World War II and not just Type 99s, um, a lot of Japanese rifles. So on this guy, uh, this is a chrysanthemum. It's a mark of imperial ownership of the firearm, that this gun is the personal property of Emperor Hirohito, and um, you represent him when you carry it, so you know, act accordingly. They were marked, the Japanese stuff was marked pretty consistently, um, and in Japanese, this makes good sense. This is 9, 9, type. Very simple. Uh, the trick, the, the two common ones, the, the Japanese stuff, are type 99s and type 38s. Um, you can tell them apart by caliber. One's 7.7 millimeter, one's 6.5. If you can't remember 7.7 is 38, 9.9, nine, if you can't remember that connection, the easy way to do it with Japanese, which is cool, because it's 99, the two characters are the same. If it's three different characters, it's a type 38, most likely. If it's two of the same, and then a third one, it's a type 99. Uh, you can also tell them apart by the gas vent holes. These had one, the others had two. Here's one that actually took me a little bit of time to track down, and my photo isn't the best. Um, this is marked Wards, Western Field, model EJN757, caliber 308. Uh, the wards refers to Montgomery wards, which I, are they still in business? Do they exist? Um, a lot of these companies, uh, in fact it was funny, when I was putting this together I realized that afti.org has a decent starting database of this sort of thing. Um, a lot of the big box stores early in their histories, Montgomery wards, Sears in particular, bought guns from manufacturers but wanted them with the, their own store brand name. So Western Field was not a gun manufacturer. Western Field was the brand that you bought from Montgomery Wards. Sears had their own brands, a couple other big stores did. Yeah. Um, and if you want to find out where the gun actually came from, you have to determine who actually made it. Um, the brand name is good, that tells you at least where it got sold at retail. Um, but for example, if you need parts for it, um, if you want to find out if it's domestic U.S. or imported, you need to know who actually made it. Um, like I said, afti.org actually has a decent database. There are a couple others out there. This is the sort of thing... Mm -hmm. uh, I got stuff came to from Brownell. Okay. That's a good point, yeah. Okay. And the, the trick is, I don't think any of them are complete. They're all overlapping and slightly different. Um, this one jumped out at me in particular because it was one I was trying to resell and it took me a long time to figure it out. <laughs> um, this thing is actually a 1950s Belgian made FN Mauser. And the funny thing is, back then, a Belgian Mauser was, you know, this imported piece of junk. You don't want a Belgian gun, you want an American gun. And today, it's exactly the opposite. You don't want a gun made by Montgomery Wards. You want a gun made by FN in Belgium where they really know how to do it right. <laughs> um, which, not as a forensic thing, but as a marketing thing, made a big difference selling that thing. It's probably worth twice as much when you can tell someone it's actually made by FN than it's you know, another Montgomery Wards Western Field you know, dollar a piece kind of thing. Um, manufacturer name is one of the things that usually is pretty evident, but not always. And there's stuff you can learn from them. Um, civilian guns, usually you got a company name. Um, you may also have a region, um, an address. You know, if it's 1900 and you're manufacturing guns, you don't have a website. Um, you know, you figure someone, someone has your gun and their buddy comes up and goes, wow, that's really nice. Where can I get one of those? It might 
be difficult to find that information. You know, okay, it's made by XYZ company. How do we find them? Where are they? Well, we'll, we'll mark the location as well as the company. Um, it's interesting that um, telegraph addresses early on would be, uh, you, could, you could actually, if you addressed a telegram to Mauser, Germany, it would get through. Um, and a lot of these are fairly similar. As long as you had like the basic city, a big concern um, would be able to get their mail. But you have to have at least a city, something. Um, military guns, you will often have an arsenal name or an arsenal mark. The names are nice, like this one, Spandau, very simple, that's where it was made. Uh, markings are also common. Um, the Japanese guns, for example, have, there are like five or six different arsenals where they were made. Some of them in different countries, some in, one in Korea, one in China. Uh, but they don't actually write a name, they just have a little symbol that indicates what arsenal it came from. Um, and that's sort of the stuff where there's just this huge rabbit hole to go down of how much detail do you want to get into on one specific model that you're trying to track down. Um, in this case, this happens to be a Gewehr 88. It was a German standard military rifle before the Mauser. Um, a little bit interesting in that the, the German government was looking for RFPs on a new bolt-action rifle. And they got a whole bunch of submissions. They didn't like any of them, and they decided to pick and choose, and they'd take the bolt from that one, the magazine from that one, the barrel shroud from that one, and the whatever, something else from this other one, and clutch them all together into one gun. Um, and it actually worked reasonably well. Um, they're not too bad. But they were made at like seven different military arsenals. And they all have the same markings, which is cool. Um, or they, they all have the same standard. They'll, you'll always find the crown, you know, the imperial mark, and then the arsenal name, and then the, the year of manufacture. The star, for what it's worth, you can see this is a World War I production. The star indicates it was made from leftover parts, or assembled from the parts bin. Um, some people put a lower value on that. There's nothing wrong with it. Good example of an early on pistol that's got a manufacturer's location. This is out of Somerda. Um, Dreisse, big German sporting manufacturer, also military contractor. They made everything. Sporting guns, pistols, machine guns. Um, Somerda was a, a big industrial area in Germany. Still is, I think. Um, you remember we talked about the German proof marks? Crown N. Does anyone remember what a crown N is? Bingo. Smokeless powder. Um, this happens to be a model 1907. 1907, still legitimately possible that you'd be making black powder guns because they'd be cheaper. Um, but we know for a fact this is smokeless. It's in 32 auto, um, although it doesn't say that anywhere right here. And we've got it marked on the slide. Um, I believe that is the breech assembly and on the frame. Stamp it everywhere. They're, they're Germans, they like that. We'll get to that even more in a sec. Um, country of origin is something you see a lot and it doesn't, usually isn't actually, on a military firearm, isn't actually original to the gun. So we had a law in the US, I assume everyone's familiar with the 1968 Gun Control Act that requires import markings. Prior to that, um, there was a requirement. The guns that came into the country for commercial sale had to have a country of origin marked on them. And that is why you will find things like, this is an Egyptian semi-auto rifle. It's from the 50s. And it's got markings in Egyptian, or in Farsi, Arabic, one of the two, I'm not entirely sure. And then it's got made in UAR. You know, there is no reason why an Egyptian factory making Egyptian guns for the Egyptian military would write where they were made in English. This was done, and it's, this tells us, this was done by an importer. Or maybe the factory had an oversupply, and they decided to, the factory itself, sell some guns commercially to the US, because we'll buy anything. Um, commercial guns, you know, if it's a, an actual sporting firearm, it will come into the country with a, a country of origin mark on it, pretty much always. And a lot of times, that's going to be something like, this, where the, comp the company puts it on there for their own advertising and their own reputation. If it's military, that usually gets added on after the fact. Um, 
And you'll have to look at the context of the gun to determine is this military sporting? Why is this marking on it? Um, does anyone know what UAR is? No, close. That's what a lot of people look at this and think. Yes, it's United Arab Republic, which was Egypt in the 50s. I think Rashids are about the only thing that are marked UAR. Um, when, by the time they were making AKs and exporting them, it went Egypt. Um, all right, so we were just talking about import marks. Prior to 68, country of origin, and that's all you needed. And that was only if the gun was commercially imported. So you know, if I'm in World War II and I capture a Mauser and bring it back, nothing. It's, it's mine. It's a war trophy. It doesn't have to have any markings. It won't have any markings. Um, actually, one way you can sometimes tell vet bringbacks is they will be, the stock will be cut in half underneath the front barrel band on a rifle. The reason being that the gun was longer than a standard duffel bag. And if you're wandering around with a Mauser on your shoulder, some officer is going to take it for his own. What you want to do is be able to stuff it in your duffel bag so no one, you know, so it's not blatantly obvious. But a lot of these rifles are too long. You take the stock off. Stock is still too long, so they'd cut the stock, but they'd put the cut under the barrel band so it didn't, you know, you couldn't necessarily tell. Um, and that's a fairly common thing to find uh, on World War II era stuff. If you're a collector, always pull that barrel band off and look to see if they chopped it in half. Um, at any rate, in 68, Gun Control Act changes a lot of that. Um, for one thing, obviously, it requires serial numbers. Most guns, all, pretty much all military guns prior to 68 had serial numbers. It was a quality control thing. Um, the idea was you'd put, well, we'll get to serial numbers in a minute, but um, as of 68, you need a whole bunch of other crap as well. Um, the gun, now this doesn't have to be all put in a single mark, but the gun on it has to include a serial number, a manufacturer's name, country of origin, the model designation, the caliber, the importer's name, and the city and state in which the importer are located. Which leads us to things like this. Um, usually, early on, yeah, uh, that's obvious, right? Clearly. Um, early on, a lot of this stuff was done fairly subtly. Um, this particular mark is on the underside of a barrel, like just behind the front sight where you wouldn't normally look for it. You put the thing on a rack, it's invisible. Uh, you have to know where it is. But you can see in here we've got model designation, we have country of origin, we have caliber, we have the importer's name, this is Century Arms International, or Century International Arms, and location, St. Albans, Vermont. Uh, it doesn't have a serial number, because the rifle already has a serial number marked on it elsewhere. Um, and Actually, oh, yeah, and our caliber is on there. So this little stamp actually covers that whole list of required information. Uh, in 2002, I mean, this is one of those things that isn't dictated by law. It's dictated by ruling and interpretation. Exactly what does it mean that the, you know, where does the thing have to be stamped? How does it have to be stamped? How deep, how large the letters have to be? None of that's actually specified in the GCA. Um, so it's interpreted, um, which of course means it gets worse every year. Um, in 2002, they spe ATF specified that the markings had to be conspicuous. And what that has led to um, is big dot matrix markings right on the side of a receiver. You can see this is exactly the same information, with the exception it's a different model. Um, and they stuck a serial number on it, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, you can see the serial number actually starts with 9130 which is the model number. Um, the serial number, and the reason they did this, the serial number cannot contain non-Latin characters. So if it was Greek or Persian or Thai or something in Cyrillic involved in that serial number, like if it had, a say, a, a two-letter Cyrillic uh, letter prefix, the importer has to give it a new serial number that is all standard Arabic numerals, which is what they've done here. Uh, this sort of thing once you put together what all the different patterns are, will allow you to tell when a gun was imported. They don't have to mark when it was imported, but you can tell based on the style of the import marks. Uh, for example, this is a late one. This, 
This is an earlier one. We can't date it exactly, but we know that this is the sort of thing that came in 80s, 90s, that's 2000s. Yes. As far as the law is concerned, that is the serial number. It's got a much nicer, fancier one stamped on the barrel up here, which has no legal standing at all. Um, yep. And as much as, as a collector it pains me to see something like this gouged into the side of a rifle, from a tracking perspective, that makes really good sense because I don't think there are probably any databases out there that have Greek, Cyrillic, Thai characters built into them. Um, now there are some exceptions, like with everything else. Even today in the US, the rules are a little bit fluid. Um, for very collectible stuff, ATF sometimes makes exceptions. This is All of this importing is done on a per case basis. So you file an application for a permit to import some guns. And part of that process is stamping the required information on them. Um, there are some collections of things like Lugers that are extremely valuable coming out of Europe where the importers, which are often high-end auction companies, are making specific special deals with ATF as to where they're going to mark and how. And you end up with like one millimeter tall laser engraved markings on the underside of the magazine well, where if the magazine's in the gun it hides it which is great for the collector. It makes your work a little bit harder. Um, this isn't quite that. This is an older one, but this is, um, I think that's actually upside down. And without a magnifying glass, you can't even tell what that says. But that's something along the lines of, you know, C-A-I-S-T-V, actually, tell that one. it's California, it's someone in California. Um, um, that's a Luger pistol, and that's on the underside of the trigger guard, so you have to actually rotate it up and, and look there. Um, under the front of the barrel is the very com most common place for rifles, um, except for the new stuff where it's blindingly obvious. Um, sometimes you'll get the side of the receiver, sometimes they're tiny like this. Occasionally, and this is only on some of the really the oldest ones, you'll actually find the import marks underneath grip panels. You have to take the grips off um, because at the time, you know, if, if the government's not going to regulate it one way or the other for the purpose of our collectors who don't want the guns to look molested, We'll mark it where you can't see it unless you really know to look. Um, so this is a, an example of a pre-68 import mark. Um, a lot of this stuff, there's a huge batch of guns that came out of Spain. Um, you guys familiar with a company called Interarms? Uh, Sam Cummings and Interarms bought the entire, everything that the Spanish had accumulated through the Spanish Civil War. Spain decided to standardize on some new stuff, Setmes, I think, at the time. Um, and they just sold everything else they had as like a batch deal to Interarms. And they stamped Made in USSR on it. Um, well, on the stuff that came out of Russia originally. Uh, usually, it's funny that kind of like the upside down airplane stamp, there are a number of these that are stamped Mark Made in URRS. <laughs> yeah. Um, this was probably not Interarms, this was probably someone else working at the same time. Um, this sort of marking, when it's in the absence of, say, an importer's name and location, tells you that this thing commercially came into the country prior to 68, which may be useful at some point. Um, oh, and you can't, this, it, maybe this is me being nitpicky, but I find it interesting that I bet they did this to the guns that were made before the USSR existed as well. There are probably a lot of rifles out there that were made in Russia that are marked USSR. That's probably pointless nitpicking on my part. But. All right, so we, we kind of touched on serial numbers, but we'll look at it a little more in depth here. Um, obviously, GCA 1968 requires serial numbers prior to 68. Didn't have to have it, most guns did. Generally it was the cheap stuff that didn't. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that in general. 22s, shotguns. Um, as I said, basically all military guns have serial numbers. Um, the point there was not to, basically the point of the serial numbers there was more to keep track of the guns inside the factory. And this is especially why they have serial numbers on a bunch of different parts. Um, touch on that? Yeah. 
So the idea is you would assemble this gun, and since we're talking you know, pre-1950, uh, sometimes pre-1900, you don't have necessarily the interchangeable parts that we do today. So you have workmen, craftsmen, who are hand fitting these guns together. You, know, you take the rough components and then fit them to a single gun. And then you serial number all the parts because when you take that thing apart again to go to, say, the bluing tank, you're going to end up with another just bin of hammers and a bin of bolt stops. And you want to make sure that those parts all go back into the original same sets because they're already hand fitted together. Um, so a lot of early guns, you'll serial number all the major components, uh, the Germans in particular because they're German. Um, uh, and you'll get abbreviations. So you know the full serial number on this thing, this is a, a broom handle Mauser, um, 52297. But things like the hammer where there's not a lot of space, they'll just take the last three digits, sometimes even the last two on very small parts. Um, there are occasionally places where it's different. Um, some of the versions, some of the types of Japanese rifle had a serial number, and then they also had an assembly number. And what they would do is hand fit the guns and give them an assembly number, which is three digits. And that way they can, they can hand fit a thousand guns at a time, put assembly numbers on all the parts, send them through finishing, and then reassemble them into complete guns and then serial number them. So a lot of people will look at that and say, ah, well, none of the parts match. You know, it's been mixed and matched and whatever. When in fact, if it's a version that was done with assembly numbers, it's not. The assembly number and the serial number are not intended to have anything in common. Um, that's fairly rare. There aren't a lot of guns like that, um, the main ones being Japanese. Yeah, um, being German, they serial numbered the screws that held the trigger guard in. Um, and even worse, they actually put military acceptance marks, little Waffenops, on the screws. Uh, with German stuff, World War II and earlier, that is the rule, not the exception. Um, usually, occasionally, you know, collectors obviously put a high premium on all of the numbers matching. Um, what you will find, it's not totally uncommon to find that. They also, uh, replacement parts often were not numbered. You know, they'd make a batch of replacement parts and you'd never know what gun it was going to end up in. So you'll occasionally find unnumbered parts mixed in where, you know, if this is the 50th Mauser you've looked at, you go, uh, there's no, that one's supposed to have a serial number. Well, it means it's a replacement part from some point in the gun's life. Um, the most common thing you'll probably find mismatched are bolts in rifles. Uh, pistols are much more typically complete and unmolested because most people aren't taking apart pistols and swapping parts in them. Uh, what happened in rifles is typically with um, shipping or uh, troops bringing guns back as trophies, the bolts will all be confiscated by you know, whatever officer was in charge and basically stuck in a bag in his cabin until the ship got back to the U.S. and then everyone got a bolt back. So they didn't have a bunch of GIs running around with guns and misbehaving. Um, and often they took no care to actually match the correct bolts to the correct guns. That's why you typically find mismatched bolts in military rifles. Um, another uh, element to be aware of on serial numbers is and this is particularly on military guns where they're not made with U.S. import laws in mind. You know, the commercial stuff is all made, we know it's going to the U.S., we're going to make it so that it you know, fits U.S. law, easy, done. On the military stuff, they're making it, in this case, we're making this thing for the Russian army. And we don't know or care what U.S. import laws are, they don't affect our, our processes. But this gun may end up in the U.S. anyway. Um, there are a shitload of AK parts kits that came into the US, for example. Um, and this is one of those situations where the, the European focus on pressure bearing components comes into conflict with the US focus on receivers as a specific type. There's a serial number here. And I mean, this that's the manufacturer's serial number. It looks legit. It seems fine. There's, there's our arsenal mark, Tula, 1986, six digit serial number. It's great, except that that's on the front trunnion. This piece down here, sheet metal, it's the receiver. This guy 
the trunnion. The barrel fits in there. That pin holds the barrel in place. This is what holds, you know, keeps the barrel from flying out of the gun when you fire it. It's a much more significant part than the receiver, and so that's what the Russians put the serial number on. In fact, pretty much all AKs are serial numbered right here on the side of the front trunnion. It's the right size, it's visible, it's evident, it's good. It's a part you can't easily remanufacture, should you want to. Um, but that's not legally a US serial number because it's not on the receiver. If I disassembled this rifle, I drilled the rivets out, I would end up with an AK receiver with no serial number on it. Um, possibly a full auto AK receiver with no serial number on it. So on U uh, USAKs, the importers or domestic manufacturers stamp serial numbers on them elsewhere. Um, sometimes you'll find them right here. Sometimes you find them on the underside right there, um, occasionally around the trigger guard, somewhere on the actual bent steel receiver. Um, I should say an AKM that has a, a stamped receiver. If it's, say, a parts kit that came in, you'll find two serial numbers on it. You'll find one here, stamped by Russia or Romania or Bulgaria or whoever manufactured it. And then there will be another serial number somewhere on the sheet metal receiver that was put on by the U.S. importer or manufacturer. And this is not the official serial number. In fact, that's meaningless legally. Um, if it's a good, you know, if it's a manufacturer that's paying attention, they'll match the serial number. You know, if you're going to build this kit into a gun, just, you know, use that as your serial number. It's marked in two places, but it makes sense. It's easy to trace. Um, but this could be serial number two. And if it's got two, you know, down here with a manufacturer's name, that's the legal serial number. And that's what it ought to be referenced as. Has so anyone? We're not talking about shotguns right now, but uh -huh. a couple bands I've been thinking of. Is that the deal with Benelli, like the Nova thing? I think the mark on the barrel, and then there's a whole separate serial number on the receivers, and I never could figure out why they were doing that. I expect so, yeah. Italian, I don't know for sure, because it's newer than I normally pay attention to, but I would expect that Italian law requires them uh, to deal with pressure bearing parts like the barrel. And they probably have one run of guns that they use for Europe and for the US. And so they just leave the European style numbers on, on everything and I add. I thought the same thing you did about the Benelli. Why would you, if they're going to do that and sell a bunch in the United States, why would they mark it? Or if they are only going to mark some of them, why wouldn't you just match the serial number you put on the barrel? Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting in, in Europe when you're looking at. Since I mentioned parts kits, in the US, of course, you have to chop the receivers up. The receiver's gone, the rest of the gun's a nothing. That's changed a little bit with barrels, but in general, if it's here in the country, chop the receiver and you're done. In England in particular, in Europe in general, when you're demilitarizing and, and disabling firearms, they care about the gas piston, if it has one, the trunnion, the barrel, and the bolt. Because those are, frankly, and frankly, their system is smarter than ours is, or more effective at doing what it's intended to do. Those are the parts you can't easily remanufacture. They're at least harder. Because an AK receiver is pretty easy. I've built AK receivers from stamped sheet metal. Um, there's not really anything traumatic or difficult about it. But it'd be really hard to build an AK front trunnion. In England, if you're going to demill a gun, to turn it into our equivalent of a parts kit, you have to chop or weld up the trunnion, chop or weld up the barrel, wake up the computer, um, which puts it in this interesting position of in England, you can legally run around with all the receivers you want. And over here, you can run around with all the barrels and trunnions and gas pistons and bolts that you want. And I'm sure someone has figured out and has a small time criminal enterprise going of matching, you know, selling barrels over there and bringing back receivers. All right. So this has one serial number, and only one serial number. Um, this is yet another Mos and the Gaunt. I mentioned that you can find examples of pretty much anything and everything on Mos and the Gaunts. In this case, it is a Finnish gun. It was issued to the Finnish Civil Guard. So eh, pretty much the same as our National Guard. The Finns had a formal army, and then like their second line reserve guys were in the Civil Guard. Civil Guard is divided into a whole bunch of different districts that are numbered. So this got issued to District, and the S stands for Civil Guard, District 64518. It actually then got taken out and reissued to a different district, 
So it has another one of these numbers that's stamped on the opposite side of the receiver, neither of which have anything to do with the fact that it is serial number 232730. This is not a defaced serial number. This was actually done by the Finns, and it wasn't a serial number in the first place. Um, Finnish stuff is probably the most likely place you'll see something like that. Um, there are unit marks that a lot of other countries used. Um, Germans, German World War I stuff, it's not uncommon to find with unit marks, but usually they're more letters than numbers. You know, they'll, if they were American unit numbers, they'd be things like, you know, first company, second platoon, field infantry, that sort of marking in all abbreviated together. The Finns are a, a somewhat uncommon example of a unit marking that's all numeric and easily confused for a serial number. Um, one other instance you'll find something like this, um, some sniper rifles, um, older military sniper rifles, would have the serial number of the scope that they were fitted with marked on the side of the receiver. And if the gun was, um, like many most of the guns were, um, uh, taken out of service as a sniper and rebuilt as just a standard infantry rifle, they'd do the same thing. They'd X out the, the scope serial number. Which again is something easily confused for, you know, a defaced illegal serial number, when in fact it's not. Um, to make this more potentially confusing, this whole thing could easily be a legal antique if it's got a, a pre-98 receiver on it, which we don't know from this photo. Um, we kind of talked about this earlier, uh, databases being able to accept non-English characters. That looks like AK. It's not. It says Cyrillic capital D. Um, and that, that's actually, coincidentally, it is an AK serial number. But um, So this is why they require, um, as of now, putting new serial numbers on guns that have non-Latin characters. Because, you know, is this 746? Is it AK 746? Is it DK 746? Three potentially very easy different ways to put a thing into a database, and then all of a sudden you can't trace it. Because, you know, you put in one number, someone else put in a different number. Um, same thing. That's the serial number. I can't read it. <laughs> Uh, it's not as uncommon as you might think. Um, it's Egyptian. Because the British were heavily involved in Egypt, there is a fair amount of British surplus weaponry that went to Egypt and that got marked with Egyptian script and then may have come back through British channels. So it is out there. Uh, there's a good one. That's also a serial number. Um, you can see it's actually mismatched. As is common, the bolt has a different number. Um, in this case, it wasn't a trophy. This is a, a Siamese, now Thai, rifle. And it was probably just that uh, the importer pulled all the bolts out for packaging and then didn't bother to put them back in the original guns. You know, it's funny, with the, the script like this, it's often the first challenge is figuring out that it's numbers and not letters. You know, is this a model number? Is it a serial number? Is it a date? Is it a scratch? Um, this is something we see a lot today. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. Um, serial numbers have embedded information in them, and occasionally they have characters associated with them that may or may not actually be part of the serial number. So first thing, easy, a production block code. You know, we're going to use a four-digit serial number, and when we get to 9999, we'll throw an A in front of it. So it goes 9999, then A0001, A2, A3, and then we hit the B block, the C block. Something like that, the number, or the letter, is absolutely a part of the serial number. Um, you'll occasionally get date codes, and sometimes they're going to be like the couple that we looked at earlier, where it's a serial number dash a two-digit two date code, which may or may not be legitimately considered part of the serial number. Um, I think in a lot of those cases, there really isn't um, a standard for it. Correct me if I'm wrong. You may, you probably have more exposure to the legal uh, side of that than I do. 
but some of these are fairly obscure guns, and you know, it's a Madsen bolt action. There's only probably 5,000 of them ever made. Does that year code go in the serial number or not? Be aware of it. If you don't know, make, um, I don't know exactly how the database systems work, but either make a note or try checking it by both numbers. Um, sometimes your prefix isn't actually a, a production block code. It may be, on most of the guns, again, um, several production runs of them, the serial numbers were prefixed with the letter N. And it's not part of the serial number, it's just number 1234. Um, but it may go into someone's database. You know, the last guy who booked the rifle into his FFL may have put the N in. The guy after that may not have. Um, same thing with the, the R suffix, um, which you'll find on a lot of Cyrillic stuff. The R just means year. Um, it's, and it's not quite an English R. Um, it's a Cyrillic letter. Should not go into a serial number, definitely. Um, but a lot of people are going to mistake that for a letter, and they go, ah, you know, it's number 1234R. Let's see. Uh, model and feature designations, those are something that's more modern than it is historical um, and doesn't have a direct impact on, you know, it's, it's not something that can be or is likely to be confused. You know, they'll, they'll put a hyphen A for this finish, hyphen B for that finish. Um, something where you can tell information about the gun based on just the serial number. Calibers. Um, caliber legally has to be marked on the gun commercially. Um, what you'll find with a lot of military stuff is that they will mark the bore diameter only. So this particular gun is in 30. 30 carbine, 30 .308, 30 .6, 30 .3, 30 .30. You're going to have to figure out what the, the caliber actually is in context. What's the rest of the rifle? Uh, where did it come from? What ought it be? Um, you know, in this case, um, it's a South American Mauser that was converted to 30 .6. Um, could very easily be 308 uh, for the same sort of reason. Uh, you'll find the same thing with pistols, um, 765. In fact, I think we're about to get to that. There you go. There's your Holo R. Um, they made, so Holo R is this, actually very cool. I'll, since we have some extra time, I'll tell you the history of that pistol. Um, Spanish production, mid-1920s. And this guy named Jose Lopez Arnaez came up with this cool idea that he would hang a lever, a pivoting lever, on the side of the pistol slide so that if you only had one hand, you can hold the gun with your bottom two fingers and grab the lever with your top two and rack the slide with one hand. And it actually works. It's kind of slick. It's kind of pointless, but it's kind of slick. Um, the, the myth, the, the theory, is that he was inspired by this general in the Spanish uh, Foreign Legion who had an arm blown off. He's only got one hand, so you know, pull the pistol out, rack it with one hand, and shoot someone. Um, what he actually sold them to were the Peruvian um, civil guard, who were all mounted. And so on horseback, it actually made some sense. You got one hand on the reins, and you've got a pistol that you can cock with one hand while you're riding. Um, he came up with this lever idea, and he basically went around to a bunch of these small Spanish gun makers that we discussed at the time, who were probably running out of clients for ruby pistols, to find someone who would be willing to use his idea on their pistol. And he ran into a one company um, that had a straight blowback, very basic, simple, um, I think it was originally 32 or, or 380, uh, design that wasn't selling so well. And they figured, what the heck, what do we have to lose? We'll try throwing your, your lever onto the side of this thing. Actually, you know, they sold like 30,000 of them. It's not too bad. They're fairly rare today, but not a bad run for a company the size of the guys who made this thing. And they made them in five different calibers. Uh, 25, 32, uh, 380, 9mm Largo, which is probably the one you had, and 45 Auto. All straight blowback. They're all pretty big and bulky, a lot of weight to them. Um, and the reason that I included pictures in this one uh, is because 
on the left there, we have the markings off of a 380 Holo R. It's caliber 9 millimeter, 9 by 17, that's 380. And we have a 9 millimeter Largo Holo R, caliber 9 millimeter, which is correct because it's 9 by 23. And in fact, the one on the left is the gun that I purchased at auction, and it was advertised as 9 Largo because most of them are. And you know, you try and put a 9 Largo in the magazine, and the front half of the cartridge is hanging out over the end. Um, excellent example of you cannot, you know, the markings are all correct. They just don't tell you everything. And you have to look at the rest of the gun and figure, OK, it says 9 millimeter. 9 Largo is not going to fit. 9 Parabellum is not going to fit. What are they talking about? Or conversely, you get one of these guys. You go, ah, it's 9 millimeter. We'll put a 9 Parabellum in it. And you know it rattles back and forth in the magazine. Uh, context is very important. You know, interestingly, if you take a look at the proof marks, like we talked about earlier, does anyone remember what this indicates? We have the crossed rifle with the crown, a PV, and a lion. Probably. But we can assess a date. In fact, we, we know exactly when this was made, and we can tell roughly when this was made. Let's see if you took thorough enough notes. <laughs> Correct. So the Lion is pre-1928. The proof law that required all this stuff was passed in 23. So this was sometime between 23 and 28. Now we also have a 1924 patent date, so it clearly wasn't 23. So we can narrow this down to sometime between 1924 and 1928. This one, you know what this one is? Can you get this one? Exactly. Yep. Since it's a little bit later, that middle marking with the letter, the letter with a star over it, before it disappears, tells us exactly what year it was proofed. There are, incidentally, as far as I know, two other guns that are designed to be cocked one-handed. One is a German sort of Danish pocket pistol from the like 1920s. And one is a Chinese commercial export pistol from the 90s. German ones, so Lignos? Yes, Lignos Einhand. Um, in fact, both of them work the same way. They both have a lever that hooks the bottom of the slide and is connected to the front of the trigger guard. So instead of the trigger guard being a solid piece, the front actually slides back. You can put your finger on the trigger or put it out on the front of the trigger guard and use the strength of one finger to pull the slide back. Uh, the Lignos Ein Hand and the Norinco 77B both do that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they made a series of them, uh, 1913 through the the late 30s. They're cool guns. They have a lot of advanced features in them. And you know, actually, that's what makes a lot of the early stuff cool to me, is nobody knew what was going to work well and what was a really dumb idea. <laughs> Lignos Einhand, really dumb idea. <laughs> Holoar, pretty dumb idea. Having a cocking lever. And now, actually, the cocking lever at that point may have made a lot more sense than it would today, because your ammunition was not quite as reliable as it was today. And having a way to recock a firearm and fire it again without risk of opening the bolt and having a hang fire detonate when you've got the bolt halfway open, or without having to lose the round and chamber a new one, I can, I can see the rationale for it. A lot of the stuff, you can go, well, I see why they thought that, but boy, it was stupid. Um, all right, moving on, continuing with caliber. Um, this, 
like with the most in the guns, I'm, when I can, I'm trying to focus on guns that actually, they may be weird, but there are a lot of them in the country, and this is an example of that. Um, this is a Steyr model 1895. It's a straight pull rifle, and a couple of years, uh, a, a while ago, they came into the country, and for a while, the rifles were like 89 bucks. The ammo was dirt cheap because this is the only thing that shot it. Um, the rifles are still under 150 or 200 bucks. The ammo's pretty much disappeared today. But it's certainly conceivable that you will run into one of these in a case. Someone who wants a rifle, this is one of the cheapest rifles you can get out there. Um, designed in Austria, the Austro-Hungarian Empire used them. Didn't work out all that well for them. Um, and this is an example of something that was pretty common around the turn of the century. Countries would, you didn't want to throw away the, all these you know, hundreds of thousands of guns you have in inventory for the military. However, all of these guns are obsolete. Um, because of things like we've invented smokeless powder, or we've invented a better smokeless powder, or we've discovered that a pointed bullet works a lot better than a round bullet. Um, these rifles in particular were designed for a fairly low velocity, um, eight by 50 millimeter rimmed cartridge with a, a big heavy round nosed bullet. It was like a 244 grain eight millimeter bullet. And they used that for a little while and then they decided, you know, we can do a lot better. We'll make a lighter bullet, we'll make it a spitzer, you know, boat tail, nice point. We'll bump up the, the powder charge a little bit. And it went from like 1900 feet per second up to 24 much better aerodynamics, improved rifle. The problem was you couldn't use the same chamber on both cartridges. Because uh, the one's a big long bullet, you're either going to end up with something pretty inaccurate because it jumps, has to jump this big distance to the lands, or if you put new barrels on the guns and then you try and jam this long cartridge in, it's going it, to you know, overpressure because it's stuck on the rifling. So what they would do is they'd, they'd convert all the guns to a slightly different version of a cartridge. Um, the French did it, the Russians did it, the Austro-Hungarians did it. And they did mark the guns when they did that, but that S does not necessarily tell you a whole lot if you don't know, if you come into it not knowing what to expect. In this case, this S means this is an 8x56 instead of 8x50. It's meant for a, a modern Spitzer cartridge instead of the old, you know, World War I, pre-World War I style of round nose ball. Um, let's see, while we're on this particular picture, that is a military acceptance marking, which is in a slightly later section. This tells us that this rifle was accepted into military service in 1919, the exact date of manufacture, which you won't find anywhere else on the gun. Um, may or may not find anywhere else on the gun, depending on who made it. A uh, couple other examples of this. Uh, I should say this S, you'll find that on most of the guns, most of these straight pull rifles, but not necessarily all of them. And it's something to be aware of. Uh, so the most they got, again, um, the Finns did the same thing. Uh, they came up with their own special bullet design and they rechambered rifles to use it. It was uh, the D cartridge. Um, you'll find Ds on Finnish Mos Nagants in a variety of styles and fonts. Um, in the case of the Mos Nagant, it's not that big a deal. Um, it wasn't something where the other ammunition was really incompatible, um, just not optimal. In the case of French firearms, you can actually get in trouble. Um, they went to a larger, heavier cartridge, a larger, heavier ball, um, primarily for use in machine guns, but then they rechambered all of their infantry rifles to use it, so they had all the same kind of ammo. And sticking that style of ammo into a rifle that wasn't converted for it will lead to overpressure. Um, probably won't blow up, but the bolt's gonna stick, it's gonna be unpleasant. It's not good. The N indicates ball N, which was the new version. And if a gun's been converted, it'll be stamped N on the barrel and the receiver, like this. If it hasn't been converted, there'll be nothing there. Almost everything you find that's French will have been. Um, you know, some collector decides to go postal and has some really cool early ones that weren't converted that they missed. You'll find that. Um, actually, I found one myself just through normal channels that, um, that was in fact what 
pushed me to figure out what these markings were because my ammo was not pleasant and recoil seemed heavy and the bolt stuck every single time I fired it. And I looked in and went, oh, well, that would be why. Um, one indicator, this is probably the most common single indicator you can find about caliber conversions. Um, again, this happens more than you might think on military stuff. Um, a lot of armies really don't want to waste the money throwing away otherwise good rifles when they could spend a little bit of money, upgrade them, have them continue to be usable. Uh, in this case, you know, we took a look at that Gewehr 88 earlier with the uh, Spandau mark. This is another one of them. These are both identical guns, or they were originally. I don't know if you can read it. It actually says GEW, excuse me, 88. This was designed for the German, the early version of German 8mm Mauser, which is, it's a 323 bore diameter, so it's a little bit big. It uses a, a long round nose bullet. When they realized that wasn't particularly aerodynamic or efficient, they redesigned it, the cartridge, for the modern 8mm that gets used today. It's a 318 bore, smaller, and it uses a pointed bullet. When they did that, the, the pointed bullet actually was longer uh, in final overall length. So they had to cut a little notch out at the front of the receiver. Um, distinct to the Gewehr 88, they also cut a stripper clip guide in them at the same time. But the, the important feature to keep an eye out for is this. This rifle is original. This one has been converted because this ammo won't fit. It's too long to go into the receiver. The other place you will find this fairly frequently is a lot of South American rifles would have been purchased in 7mm Mauser or 7.65 Mauser and converted to 30-06 because the U.S. started supporting the military. Um, you know, hey, we'll, we'll provide you rifles and ammo and machine guns and if we're providing that, it only makes sense for the country to go back and retrofit its older stock to continue using it. The 30-06 is longer than most of these other cartridges, and it requires a notch like that in the front of the receiver. Let's see. Um, everyone's, obviously, people know about 9mm. You know, 9mm what? There's like a bazillion of them. Um, when it comes to older guns, the four that you're going to run into most often, um, 380 isn't something we often get confused about in the commercial gun trade today, but 380 used to be much more commonly called 9mm, like on the Holo R, or 9mm K, 9mm Kurtz, 9mm Short. Those are all names for 380. Um, metric, it's 9 by 17, but like nobody ever calls it that. Um, I left Makarov out because Makarov is later, um, this applies to 9mm Makarov, but I assume you guys are familiar with 9 Mac. Um, Parabellum is the obvious one. Um, actually, I left out 9 Glicenti, which is Italian, uh, Glicenti, which is dimensionally identical to Parabellum, but it's loaded significantly lighter. And if you run Parabellum through one of the Italian pistols chambered for Glicenti, you will damage it and eventually it'll just self-destruct. Um, some of their submachine guns too, actually, although I don't think you'll ever run into those. Um, nine Browning is one that's fairly rare, but you may at some point run into. Um, you guys familiar with the, the Colt 1903 pocket hammerless? Very classy pistol. Gangsters and you know ambassadors. And, um, several, mili several countries' militaries, especially up in Scandinavia, um, adopted a slightly upscaled version of that. Longer barrel, a little bit bigger, uh, chambered in 9 Browning, which is 9 by 20 semi-rimmed. Not much has used that since like 1920, but they are out there. And you're not going to be able to run them effectively with any other cartridge. Um, and the worst one is stupid freaking 9mm Largo. There are at least three, if not like a dozen, 9 by 23 cartridges that came out of Europe um, in you know, 1900 through like 1920. Uh, Largo is the most common one because it was adopted by the Spanish military and they kept it up through World War II. But 9mm Bergman Bayard, uh, 9mm Bergman, 9mm Steyr, uh, 
you know, the, the nine Steyr pistols are not that uncommon. It's commonly called a Steyr Hahn or a 1912 Steyr. Um, they're an Austrian military pistol in World War I. There are you know, hundreds of thousands of them out there. And they're chambered in nine Steyr, but all these things are pretty much dimensionally identical. Nine by 23 kind of works. Um, depending on what 9x23, it may be a little bit hotter. It may not have quite the exact same taper, so it may not run reliably. Um, honestly, I, I don't even have all the details of these things figured out. Um, what you can generally safely assume is that 9mm Largo is for Spanish pistols and rifles and subguns. And the Spanish ones are the, probably the most common out there. Um, Astra 400s, uh, the Holo R in Largo. So your best bet if you want to be able to test fire some of this stuff is get the, someone to buy some surplus Spanish 9mm Largo and use that in Spanish 9mm Largo guns and you're pretty much set. Um, you're a lot less likely to run into something like a, a Bergman. They're out there and they're cool, but not nearly as many of them. So a couple of people asked outside, and I'll just say it for everyone. If you guys run into weird stuff that, you're like, this is crazy and 100 years old, and I don't know what the heck it is, please, by all means, send me pictures of it. I would love, I'd, I'd love identifying that sort of stuff. I should probably actually give you contact info. Um, uh, so my, my website is ForgottenWeapons.com. My email address is admin at ForgottenWeapons.com. Admin. Admin. Short for administrator. Yeah. It was too easy at babies that were arguing in my office, so I just wondered which way it was going to go eventually. Uh, honestly, it is. I think a lot of that stuff comes down to interpretation. So, which one of them was senior? <laughs> uh, um, speaking of governments arguing, occasionally you do get helpful government ideas. Um, this is, of course, the broom handle Mauser. These were originally in 7.63 millimeter Mauser, which is this neat little bottleneck cartridge, um, one of the very first automatic pistol cartridges. Of course, World War II or World War I, the Germans started going with 9 millimeter Parabellum, the Luger pistols, the early submachine guns. They reboard broom handle Mausers for 9 millimeter Parabellum, and in order to avoid mixing them up, they put a gigantic red nine in the grip on all of them. Um, these are actually fairly valuable collector's items. Most broom handle Mausers are, but these in particular. Um, and that nine is, it's nine millimeter. It's all nine of them, not the little one, the big one. Um, so yeah, it, it runs the gamut from the Steyr straight pulse. We'll mark an S and that will tell you that we've converted it from the short round cartridge to the long pointy cartridge to Helpful stuff like this and the Israeli Mausers that have giant 7.62 markings all over them. Uh, military acceptance marks. This is, when you get the military stuff, this is actually fairly common and can tell you a decent amount of information, more or less, depending on which country. Um, often these are done in lieu of proof marks. Proof marks are often commercial markings only, and if a gun is made you know, in the U.S., we don't, our, our military guns generally come from civilian contractors. Um, in a lot of European countries, and in the U.S. historically, often military arms are made by government-run state military arsenals. And so they're not, uh, they're not subject to proof laws, and they have a different, you know, they're still going to get tested and, and proofed with overpressure cartridges, but they're going to be marked differently. They're not going to have the standard commercial markings. Instead, they're usually going to have like one standard military acceptance mark. And having that instead of a proof mark can tell you things like this was a military contract gun or this was a commercial gun that the military then accepted or vice versa. Um, there are a lot of these. They change. Um, they can change you know, over time. Sometimes you know, each different model of gun can have a, a marking that was more or less specific to it. These are some that are a little more reliable and a little more common. Um, Swiss, little Swiss uh, cross in a shield, pretty standard. You'll find that on a lot of stuff. Um, 
Israel is a, a bit of an outlier uh, because the Israelis didn't make a whole lot of guns, but they, especially early in Israel's history, they bought up all sorts of stuff, whatever they could find. Um, so they had this huge mishmash of different guns. So, you know, Mausers could be Israeli, British stuff could be Israeli, any number of things could have been in Israeli service. And the only way you would know it is because they've put that Hebrew character on it. Um, sometimes also a Star of David with a character inside it. Um, United Kingdom has a broad arrow. Um, they appear in a number of different styles. Sometimes the, the prongs of the arrow are wider and a little bit curved. Um, and they will occasionally have other letters associated with them that will denote different parts of the empire. Australia, India, New Zealand, Canada. Um, but that a broad arrow like that is pretty much a universal indicator of British military use. Um, I touched on this marking on that converted Steyr M95. Um, that is Austrian military. Um, I don't remember what the WN stands for, but it then this, <laughs> this Rorschach blot of a marking <laughs> is actually supposed to be the Austrian double-headed eagle symbolizing Austria and Hungary as a dual monarchy. Um, and the number that follows it is the, the two-digit date of military acceptance. And those are all post-1900, so 1905 in this case. Um, France is a little bit uh, unusual in that most French military arms are made by French military arsenals, and so they don't, they don't have a lot in the way of markings to to differentiate between commercially purchased guns and French military guns. They're pretty much all military. Um, the biggest exception are these early uh, World War I pistols, the, the Ruby pistols. And the way you can differentiate a French military issue one from a commercial one, because they're scads of both, is one or two five-pointed stars under by the magazine well. Um, typically, it's one on either side of the magazine well. Um, a little bit off topic, or a little bit off the, the markings topic, one of the other ways you can often tell a military version of a pistol from a civilian one is the presence of a lanyard loop. Civilian pistols pretty much never have lanyard loops because nobody runs around with a lanyard on a pistol unless they're an officer. Um, often uh, things like um, Savage 32 automatics, the French bought a bunch of those, and they were differentiated by the fact that the French requested a lanyard loop and those are the only savages you'll find with lanyard loops. Um, the commercial ruby pistols generally didn't have lanyard loops because nobody wanted them. Um, 1911s. Um, so uh, if you're looking at ruby pistols and you want to find a French military one, look for a star or two stars on the bottom and a lanyard loop on the side of the grip. Um, I have not touched a whole lot on US military stuff here because a lot of it Frankly, a lot of it you're probably going to be more familiar with to begin with. Um, U.S. is pretty good about marking stuff. You know, usually, like I said, they've got these big, long military-style designations stamped right on the side of the thing. You know, pistol, comma 45, comma model of 1911. That just tells you everything right there. Um, one of the things you will find, and this transcends common and uncommon, and in fact, most Nagants, as with everything else. You can find this on. A, U a U.S. military acceptance mark is a flaming bomb. Um, kind of like the Spanish one, but more flame. Um, you will sometimes find that with U.S. stamped under it, sometimes not. Um, and that simply indicates that this firearm was accepted into military service. It won't tell you when. It doesn't mean that it was manufactured in the U.S. or that it was manufactured for the U.S. military. Um, but for example, a, a good example with the most Nagants. Um, I mentioned earlier that Remington and Westinghouse made these things for Russia under contract um, starting in 1915. Well, there was an upheaval in Russia in 1917 when you know communists took over the government and executed the emperor, the czar. And uh, they were not really inclined to continue paying Remington and Westinghouse big piles of money. They weren't inclined to continue fighting World War I either, and they didn't you know, we don't really want to pay the U.S. for all these rifles that we don't necessarily need. So they just stopped paying. Um, so Remington and Westinghouse stopped sending rifles. But they had gone like halfway through this, these 
you know, roughly three million rifle contracts and were in a serious financial hardship as a result. They, you know, they'd, they'd tooled up, they'd bought equipment, they'd scaled everything intending to sell three million and they'd sold half that many. And both companies were quite literally on the verge of bankruptcy. They were in serious financial trouble. Um, and the US government stepped in, bailed them out, just like they might today, and bought all of the excess rifles that had been produced um, and issued a lot of them. Um, a bunch of them went to, were used for training. Um, a bunch of them went to US National Guard units. A s rather small number of them were actually given to mostly Michigan um, state soldiers who were sent to Archangel on the eastern coast of Russia to help fight the Bolsheviks as part of the Russian Civil War um, in 1918 and 1919. Those most Nagants all have that little US flaming bomb stamped on the bottom indicating that they were in fact US property. Um, none of the US soldiers really were enthusiastic about most Nagants. They didn't like them. They are admittedly not nearly the ergonomic and sharpshooters quality of rifle that the US 1903 Springfields were. Um, the government, US government got rid of them by the early 1920s. They sold them off for about 10% of what they'd paid for them. Um, and so a lot of those things ended up on the US civilian market. And you will find them still today occasionally sporterized, maybe rechambered in 30 out 6 with US property markings on them. And finally, I keep ta saying we're going to get to this, the Nazi, what's called a Waffenamp. Um, little, since this is something that has so much interest to a, a lot of uh, collectors and a small subset of nut jobs, um, I think some explanation is worthwhile. Um, the way the Nazis set things up were very German, um, very organized, very efficient. They took basically every factory that was producing military material for Germany and they would send a representative of the um, Waffenamt Prüfwesen, like the, someone here is in, is German. I think, did someone say they were, no? Okay. Um, this, this was an office of inspecting and accepting material for German military service. You know, make sure it's up to snuff. It's not junk, it is, it's what we wanted, the quality is okay. They had like 25,000 inspectors in this bureau. And they would send an inspector to every single factory. Um, WAA stands for uh, Waffen, uh, I can't remember the full word. It's Waffen um, something. Um, and then they'd stick, each, each factory got its own number. So this particular stamp is from factory 63. Uh, the big factories would get a bunch of inspectors, the small ones one. And this was, not just firearms, but it would also be artillery, um, leather goods, helmets, canteens, uniforms, all that sort of stuff got inspected. And any part that was deemed important enough to be inspected, if it was approved, they'd stamp that eagle. The swastika on these actual stamps is so tiny that you, it's not distinguishable. It's just a little dot blob. Um, on the actual stamps, this whole thing, these, this, the wings on this eagle can be three or four millimeters wide. Um, and the whole thing is about that same height. Um, the numbers are generally legible. And that will allow you to confirm if it's a real Waffen or if it's someone's fake. If someone bought themselves a stamp and most people don't know what factory is supposed to be what number. Um, and so a lot of fake Nazi stuff is out there. You know, someone will buy a 63 stamp and stamp it on all sorts of things that weren't actually inspected by inspector directorate number 63. Um, at any rate, what it indicates is that the, the component or the item has passed quality control and, and meets the requirements of the German army. Um, it's not a political thing. It's not a proof mark. Um, it does, in fact, you know, it shows up on wood stocks occasionally. Um, it shows up on leather goods. It shows up on holsters. It shows up on magazines. Um, uh, what you can tell from it, if it's legit, it'll tell you what factory produced it, which probably isn't really of any use to you. Um, you can normally get that. On firearm, that information is much more easily available through other means. Um, it will tell you definitively that it was from like 1938 to 1945. After that, they didn't use it so much. 
Um, oh, and they tended to stamp, you saw the screws earlier, they stamped the shit on everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, literally trigger guard screws got serial numbered and Boffinom stamped. Um, another special case, um, and uh, this exists in probably all militaries, but it's particularly easily noted and, and well defined for the British. If a part isn't up to spec, you know, it's, it's worn out or it's defective, but it's still usable for training or for drill or for practice, uh, the part will be stamped DP, sometimes big, sometimes small, depends on the, the size of the part in question. If you get a rifle in that has a DP stamped on a receiver, don't shoot it. It's probably going to be okay, but there is something wrong with that receiver. Um, and a lot of those rifles are out there because they were used as drill rifles, as training guns, you know, handling practice. Um, and so they got sold as surplus just like everything else from time to time. Um, it, DP doesn't tell you what's wrong, but it tells you there's something wrong with that gun, and it is potentially unsafe. Now, you know, you run into a rifle that has a DP stock, probably doesn't matter. Um, DP receiver, I'd be, aware, I'd be leery of, a DP bolt head, DP bolt, I wouldn't shoot it. Um, and you can find it on everything, rifles, machine guns, pistols, and all parts, anything that was out of spec, but not, you know, but we can recycle it. You know, the guys who are learning how to spin rifles with bayonets, they can use it. You'll occasionally also find this. Um, complete drill rifles will have like a red stripe or a white stripe painted on them. Um, white stripe, sorry. Uh, interestingly, a British rifle with a red stripe generally means it's in 30 out 6. During World War I, they got a bunch of Lend-Lease stuff from the US, which meant they've got a bunch of their own guns in 303. They got a bunch of guns they got from us in 30 out 6. They're often very similar. You know, often you're arming home guard troops who don't really know the first thing about guns. Um, and so a red stripe became indicative of this is an American produced gun in 30-06. Uh, you should be able to figure that out without going that far, but you can tell from a mile away if you know what that stripe is. So is the DP mark from the part you have? Yes. Um, and you'll often Typically what they do is assemble guns from DP parts. So it might be a decent receiver, you know, but the barrel got bent. So, well, okay, we'll put a new barrel on it. Um, or, you know, say the barrel's bulged. We're not going to bother to take the barrel off. We'll stamp it DP. Maybe we'll take the stock off because it's good and we'll put on a, a broken stock or a repaired stock. We are approaching the end here. In fact, we're pretty much at the end here. Um, I like unusual and weird, so I pulled out a couple of particularly goofy things. China. China has produced some really awesome, goofy... You'll notice this apparently was a collaboration between FN Browning and Mauser. Um, not known for their collaboration. Uh, usually Mauser is the one forcing the collaboration on FN. <laughs> um, so it's worth pointing out a little bit about China because while this particular gun, and I should have actually put a picture of the whole gun, it's, it, this is a nightmare of a weird one-off thing. Um, probably the most common you would see are Chinese copies of Browning 1900 pistols. So you guys familiar with Browning 1900? I saw you nod your head. Um, very early semi-auto, it's in 32 auto. What makes it look weird is it almost from the side appears to have two barrels, one above the other. Um, it actually has a recoil spring in the top and a barrel in the, the bottom. Um, one of Browning's very first semi-auto pistol designs. It's straight blowback. Um, really very high quality gun. Um, it was a huge commercial success for FN. They made something like three quarters of a million of them. Um, and rumor has it, or myth has it, that it was actually the gun that was used to assassinate um, Franz Ferdinand and start World War I although it actually wasn't. Um, however, they were very popular in China. A lot of them were exported to China. Um, China had some arms embargoes on rifles, and so they ended up with a lot of pistols by the 1920s and 30s. Uh, there were a lot of small Chinese workshops that made firearms. Some of them were extremely good. Some of them were absolutely terrible. Uh, this particular one I probably wouldn't 
trust to fire. Um, and what's funny is these guys often, because the European imported pistols had a quality premium and thus a price premium, they would try to duplicate that. They'd actually try to counterfeit it. Um, but the workmen doing this stuff read Chinese and did not read English or, or any of the Romance languages. So they had the stamps and they knew what the symbols were, but they didn't know what they meant. And that is why you end up with, well, you know, we've got a bunch of good pistols that say Browning on them, so we'll, we'll put Browning on this. We've got a bunch of Mauser 1910s and we like those. So we don't know what this marking is, but it's on the other pistol, it's good. So we'll put that one on there. Um, you can see this very faintly. That's that Belgian oval with a crown on it, which you would normally not put a proof mark in a wooden grip. Um, and, and there's actually a surprising amount of this stuff floating around. Um, there's another example. Uh, we have all these letters. Uh, not entirely sure what they mean. <laughs> um, I don't even know that these are all actually letters, but you know, S I N N B eight R E I S N I A R Sun. Um, there is one. I have a friend who's a, a pretty high-end collector of Chinese military arms prior to World War II, and wrote a book on them. And one of the things that he found doing his research was a particular Chinese factory. One one thing that is relevant is at this period. China was not a single contiguous nation. It was basically a collection of, of warlords and fiefdoms. Um, and so you know, each provincial large-scale warlord would have his own arms factory. And we're talking about very large areas here. And the smaller arms production in the areas as well. Um, one factory in particular, and I don't remember which one or where, they were really big on um, 77 which was an abbreviation for a Chinese year, I think I'm wrong here, I want to say 2577, it was anniversary of, of a major event. And they wanted to commemorate it, and so everything they made was Type 77. Didn't matter what year it was made, didn't matter if it was binoculars or machine guns, they stamped everything Type 77 in commemoration of, shall I want to say, like Marco Polo Bridge incident. I may have that wrong. Um, which makes it totally impossible to try and figure out what this stuff is after the fact if you're the one looking at it. Um, there was also at least one reasonably prolific shop that put serial numbers on the guns, but they didn't quite get the point, and they put the same serial number on every gun. <laughs> <laughs> and you may occasionally run into some of this stuff. Um, how much of these, you know, a gun like this, I'm not sure I would shoot. Um, some of the, the, the high quality Chinese stuff from this time period was excellent. It was fine. Um, and there's no reason it wouldn't be safe. But it may be difficult to tell today. You know, just take, take old Chinese firearms carefully. Um, <laughs> there's another story of a Browning sales rep traveling through China in like the late 20s. You know, Browning sold Heavy, light and heavy and medium machine guns all over the world. It was a standard thing. It was fine. Nobody cared. That's how the arms trade worked. Well, he, he had his dealer sample, 1917 water-cooled heavy machine gun traveling through China, offered it to a particular warlord who thought it was really great and confiscated it and threw him in prison and took the gun over to his arsenal and had them work on reverse engineering it. And a couple months later, they had managed to reverse engineer the whole gun and build a working one of their own. And at that point, he gave it back to the sales rep and kicked him out and proceeded to build a whole bunch of them for himself. <laughs> yeah, there's another one. These guys are better. They're getting closer. Um, yeah, so this is, it, Fabrique is supposed to be a Q. Nacional is correct. This is supposed to be D apostrophe arms with a space. That's supposed to be Ger, G-U-E-R-R-E. -E. Her still is right. This is a P, not a B. Patent de post. The caliber's right. Uh, they're better, you know. They're mostly words. <laughs> um, Uh, 
Um, they would have had a lot of Belgian guns to work with, probably more Belgian stuff than American stuff. Um, keep in mind, you know, John Browning, mo probably most prolific, almost certainly most inventive gun designer ever, worked very, very closely with FN. Um, the second half of his life, most of his gun designs, especially his handguns, were made by FN. Um, so they would have circulated the world with French markings coming out of Belgium. Um, while the Chinese were the ones forging guns in the 1920s, today a lot of it is actually Afghan. Um, from what I have been able to read, uh, you know, the, there are laws, of course, regulating reimportation of firearms into the U.S. Uh, in World War II, it was pretty easy. You got a signed paper from your commanding officer. If, you know, you found a Mauser or something and you wanted to bring it home or a Luger. Um, that ended with GCA of 86. And of course, most of the guns out there today are subject to NFA. You know, you're not going to bring back a captured Iraqi machine gun because you can't import machine guns. What you can still do are import antiques. If it was pre-1898, it's not a gun. It's not subject to U.S. import law. And U.S. troops figured that out. You know, we can't bring back AKs or Lee Enfields, but hey, there's Martini Enfields floating around here that the Afghans have had since you know three invaders back. And uh, those are cool. They're cheap. I'll buy one of those and bring it home. And local craftsmen, uh, I'm sure most people have heard of places like Khyber Pass, Pass and Peshawar where they manufacture guns with some pretty rudimentary tooling and sometimes with fairly sophisticated tooling. Um, those guys are not stupid. They have figured out how to duplicate Martini Henrys and they've gotten really good at copying markings too. At least some of them have. This is a fake, um, but it looks really good. Um, there are only really two things that bring this out as a fake, and I'll be honest, it, it totally would have fooled me. Um, you have to be pretty specifically knowledgeable about Martina Henry's to figure it out. Um, the one that you might notice is that the crown is double stamped up here. It's okay on this side, but they did it twice over here. The other thing, this marking is supposed to be IC1. So one of those should have a little tail and a little foot on it. And other than that, I mean, that's really good stamping. Um, so it's tough to identify uh, a lot of the, the faked British uh, material coming out of Afghanistan. So certainly for one thing, if it's something that you want personally for yourself, uh, research the snot out of it before you buy anything uh, or don't pay a lot. And secondly, if something like this comes in on a case, be aware that it may be authentic, it may be a forgery, and technically I suppose if it's a forged gun, it's not an antique. Um, and you may have a different criminal issue at hand. All right, last slide I have. Who can tell me what it is and why? Some of this I didn't copy, or I didn't cover, so most of it I did. So it was also in the by Israel. Yes. Yep. We, in fact, have two Israeli property marks on it. And the British time Yep. And that explains this. That leaves us three markings. We have this guy, we have this guy, and we have this guy. I'm sorry? Is that the yes. That is a crown over a BNP. The P is a little bit obscured by the Israeli stamp over it. Uh, crown BNP, what is that? Bingo. Post-1954. Now, I didn't mention this, so I will say it now. Um, one other eccentricity of British proof law, again, if it's a military gun, it's often exempt from the proofing. But if the military sells it as surplus, before it can go into the commercial stream of commerce, it must be proofed. Which means this was proofed after 1954. It was not necessarily made after 1954. Um, in fact, this one could go either way. It could be earlier, it could be later. Um, one thing you may see are things like very old Webley revolvers, you know, 19, World War I era Webley revolvers that have like 1950s proof marks on them because that's when they came out of military stock for whatever reason and were sold to surplus. Um, 
So one, the one last thing, and I didn't, I sort of covered this, but I didn't cover it specifically. Does, can anyone intuit what that means? Throw out a wild guess if you've got one. No. Bingo. So what's this? Right? And if you think about 38 and 0.767 inch, that is also known as 38 slash 200 or 38 Smith & Wesson. And that is the standard cartridge that would be used in a 38 caliber Webley British Commonwealth Service revolver. So that's what this is. Um, it's a British Mark IV Webley, or Mark VI Webley, get the two confused. It's in 38 Smith & Wesson, which the British identify as, and you know, actually this kind of makes sense. It would make more sense if, if it was universal. It makes less sense being they're only like three cartridges that people identify this way. But instead of identifying the diameter and the manufacturer, we identify the diameter and the length. So if I'm not sure if a particular cartridge will fit this gun, I can actually measure it and pretty much know, as opposed to saying it's 38 Smith & Wesson, and well, I pick one up and I don't know. You know. Um, the four tons is the pressure that it was proofed to. Um, there's our final proof mark post uh, 54, and then Israeli property marks. So now the question, which I haven't actually tried to figure out, is did this, so this started in British service. It could have then gone to Israel. In fact, it could have been left in Israel in 48 when the Israelis uh, had a war for independence. And then it might have gone back to England you know, been imported in England, and on import it was proof marked. Um, actually, no, we know that the Israeli, Israeli came later, right, because the Israeli is over the top. So it would have been sold commercially in England and then wound up in Israel. Um, I'm trying to remember my history. By 54, it might have been calm enough that the British were willing to sell guns to the Israelis. They wouldn't have been very early on because they weren't happy with the independence movement, obviously. So, yeah, I found this. I thought this was a, a cool example of what you can deduce from what otherwise is a mysterious and meaningless group of squiggles. Um, that is all that I have. I can go back over um, anything that you guys would like to recover. I'd be happy to answer any questions. We can just talk about guns because they're cool. <laughs> um, do we still have a, an email contact list going around? Awesome. Thank you. Oh, yeah, did it not make it down this side? Anyone ever used a weapon? Had one show up in a case? Yeah. They're nice guns. When I first handled them, I thought, you know, it's got a it's double action only, it's a heavy trigger pull, it's a little kind of pathetic cartridge, but um, I, I used one in a, a run and gun competition and it really came into its own. It, it, you know, I didn't notice it. It just was there and it worked and I didn't have to think about it, which is really kind of what you want in a sidearm. Yep. Um, which actually bit me in the ass a little bit because one of the stages it failed, it was, it was too quiet to set off the shot timer. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually benefited me until I pointed it out to the, the scorer. But yeah, really nice. Um, it's interesting, a lot of early 1900s, late 1800s, the, the, the common military sidearm was typically a kind of anemic revolver. Um, the, the British had the 38 Smith & Wesson, uh, which came a little bit later, but fits the pattern. The French had an eight millimeter revolver fairly low velocity. The Japanese had a low velocity 9mm revolver. The Italians had a 10mm low velocity revolver. Um, 
it's interesting that sidearms at the time were more like a, an article of rank than an actual fighting weapon. The US and the British were like the only two countries militarily who considered sidearms to be actual effective weapons. Which unfortunately means it's really hard to find the ammo for them because once people decided they wanted more powerful guns, all these things immediately became obsolete. And you know, your 7.5 seven Swiss revolver ammo is difficult to find. The nice thing about Lugers is, despite some of the, the, Germany went through a lot of machinations to try and hide their arms production mm -hmm. leading up to World War II. And thing that 24 slash 7 or 240, are you sure it was the slash, not 247? Um, at any rate, they put a lot of codes on guns. Yeah. Thank you. You know, for example, S42 obviously means Mauser. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a lot of things like that to try and hide who was making guns and how many they were making. Um, they actually did it with some of their model numbers. Through the 1920s, um, all the model numbers on new guns were all in the teens. So that it would look like they developed the, you know, well, we made that during the war. We're not making new guns. That was, that was during the war. That's the model, you know, 1918, when they were making it in, you know, 1929. They, they finally gave it up in the 30s. Nobody cares anymore. <laughs> we don't have to hide this. But the nice thing about the German stuff is there's a lot of research on it. Yeah. There's a lot of documentation, especially Lugers. There's like more written on Lugers than anything else ever in terms of collectible firearms. Yeah, I think uh, um, the Terminator was made by Mauser. Okay. He only made a 9mm Luger or a uh, 30, 30 Luger. Mauser. 30 Luger, yeah. Yeah, 30 Luger is a weird one. Yeah, it's one of those two, and he had cartridges for both of those, so. I yeah. Mean, you know, the 30 Luger bullet will just kind of fall right down the barrel, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I recognize 247. I couldn't get, Mauser sounds right. Mm -hmm. um, I've never hugely gotten into become, trying to become a Luger expert, but. Um, but yeah, as collectible guns go, they're probably one that you'll see more of than most. Because mm -hmm. everybody loved them and, you know, 10 million American troops had to come home with a Luger. There's a little bit of German stuff out there that was actually manufactured by the French right after the war. Um, they would basically occupy a German factory and just go, yeah, you guys just keep, keep doing what you're doing. Give the guns to us now instead of them. <laughs> um, which has, you know, it's interesting from a collector's point of view. A lot of the stuff, the serial numbers don't match anymore and the Waffenoms go away all of a sudden. <laughs> uh, the French wanted the guns, they didn't want the swastikas on them. <laughs> MAB. Yes. Now it was actually <coughs> made for the Belgian police. Okay. The only way to tell it was that the serial number it had an extra set of digits after the serial number. Yep. Yep. Yeah, uh, like I was talking about, sometimes they'll embed information in the serial number, and if you can pick, if you know to recognize it and pick it out, it'll tell you something. Thankfully, I had one before that that didn't have that, and then I had this one. Like, That's different. Okay. The trick is MAB had at least four versions of pistol. They had an A, a B, a C, and a D, and they're all different. Um, and then a couple variations on each one of them, of course. Um, the other interesting thing that Germany did was, and not with rifles, but with pistols, and I don't know that this has a whole lot of crime lab application, but it has collector application. They would often, they weren't picky about pistols, especially for you know, rear echelon sort of troops. And so when they took over a country like France or Czechoslovakia 
or Poland, they would very happily have the, the arms makers continue to make whatever domestic firearm they were making, whether you know Czech Model 27s or French MABs or Polish you know VIS 35 radoms. They'd have them keep making them, and they'd start putting you know they'd send a, a Waffenamt inspector out there and mark all the guns. And so there's this huge market for all the esoteric European guns that were actually in German service. Um, and that's where a lot of the fakes come from. Because you can, you know, I can buy a pre-war or a post-war one for 100 bucks, and now it's 500 bucks because the Nazis used it. Uh, which, you know, again, I don't know that that's going to be hugely relevant for you guys, but it, it's an interesting aspect to keep in mind with some of this stuff. Um, as a single comprehensive source, no. Um, Google is your friend. Yeah. One of the <laughs> uh, one of the pro <laughs> yeah, uh, they're really there are a couple that are a decent start. Um, the NRA Museum. If you do a search like for proof marks, one of the things that would usually come up, especially in image search, is a PDF that the NRA Museum has, which they I think they copied from the Blue Book of Gun Values which is decent, um, it, it can be hard to interpret. You know, if you get just the right sort of standard proof mark on a gun, that document will work for you. But there's a lot of variation. And you know, even the accepted rules, there are always exceptions to them, which can be frustrating. But it's just the way it is with a lot of the proof marking. Um, yeah, it, ultimately, it's going to come down to you're going to want to search by the model and the, the nationality and do an image search. And that's probably your best bet. Um, a lot of this stuff, there isn't all that much documentation. Um, part of the thing is, with the advent of the internet, we actually have access to massive, massively larger amounts of information about this sort of thing. If you're trying to write a book on proof marks in the 70s, you'd go to a couple museums and you'd have a really nice general reference set but you're not going to have any of the weird exceptions because they're probably pretty rare. Um, and it's hard to find that stuff because it's hard to find the people who own it. Today, on the internet, the nice thing is you can, you know, everybody who's got one of these things is on some forum somewhere or other trying to figure out what their markings are. And the people trying to find it attract the experts who like identifying it. And so you'll find answers to some of the weird stuff in totally non, you know, uh, non formal, non reliable official references because the references just don't cover it very well. So that's not exactly a helpful answer, but send it to me. I'll, I'll find where we can figure it out. <laughs> uh, well, I can let you guys go. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something worthwhile. Um, you bet. Thank you. I very much appreciate you all signing up and coming. <laughs>